my name is Alfred Hitchcock, and I would like to tell you about my forthcoming lecture. It is about the birds and their age-long relationship with man. It will be seen in theatres like this across the country. In my lecture, I hope to make you all aware of our good friends, the birds. Theirs is a noble history, and through it all, man has played a conspicuous part. This cave drawing is one of man's earliest sketches of his feathered friend. One can see at once the loving care with which the artist depicted his subject. The story of man and his friends, the birds, is filled with many fine examples of ways in which these noble creatures have added to the beauty of the world. Take this plumed hat from the period of Charles I. How proud the birds must have been to have their feathers plucked out to brighten man's drab life. Here we have a later model, a refinement of the first. Here man, or rather woman, thought enough of the birds to have an entire one as a decoration. It's quite dead, of course. Naturally, the egg plays a very prominent part in my lecture. Not a word about which came first, however. I don't believe in dealing with controversial matters. Thousands of years ago, man was satisfied merely to steal an egg from a nest and use it for food. Now he has perfected this process by imprisoning each hen in a separate cage and by scientifically manipulating the lights so that she doesn't fall into the rut of the old 24-hour day. Thus, he can induce the bird to reach fantastic heights of egg production. Originally, there were many varieties of birds on Earth. Some have become extinct. The great auk, the passenger pigeon, and the famous dodo bird have all disappeared. Actually, they didn't exactly disappear. They were simply killed off, but of course, this is nature's way. Man merely hurries the process along whenever he can be of help. Man and birds have been responsible for a great many advances in our civilization. For example, the bird was the inspiration for the invention of gunpowder, and it was his speed that brought about the development of the shotgun. But man has not been unmindful of his debt to the bird. We have honored our feathered friends in many ways. We cage birds and show them off proudly in most of our zoos. And the turkey is traditionally our guest of honor at Thanksgiving. I suspect you never realize that if it weren't for birds, even some of our pastimes would suffer noticeably. Duck hunting, for example. Granted, bagging a fellow hunter can be diverting, but the supply is rather limited. I hope you don't mind if I have something to eat, but I'm rushed today. Planning the lecture has been most educational for me. I've begun to feel very close to the birds and have developed a real sympathy for our little... What was I saying? Oh, yes, I've come to feel very close to the birds and I've come to realize how they feel when... I don't think I'll eat just now. Hardly proper with all of you here. Surely the birds appreciate all we've done for them. Don't you? Beautiful cage, fresh water, no other birds to bother you, none of that blinding sunlight. Oh! Now, why would he do that? Most peculiar. What on earth?
Okay, you're watching Movie Night Extravaganza. It is episode 11, and we're going to be talking about Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. I'm joined, as always, by uh, John Ross. Um, What's up? And, uh, and, a, and a nice panel, uh, Charlie, a.k.a. R.C. Roberts. The name of my uh, substack is Ferrochia Anime. It's, it's okay. Latin. I'm also joined by Gianni Ingenio, one of my uh, close friends, uh, film producer, director, writer, um, part of some some big projects that he's not allowed to plug right now. I don't think. Um, well, I, I can plug one. I um, I am a associate producer and story producer for the reality survival TV show Alone, which I think is having its third to last episode on tonight. So, you know, uh, catch up and then finish it next week. <laughs> but it's a good show, and um, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know. Gianni and I went to uh, high school and, and, and college together, and we're both in the film program, and we would, like, go out for drinks and talk about um, movies, like, at least, I mean, at least, like, once a month, I think. Like, I still remember we, I still remember getting really engrossed in a, in a discussion at Oasis about, um, like, random movies and, like, just not noticing that, like, people were starting to dance behind us because it was, like, an empty bar when we had gotten there. So they were, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the music was starting, and I was, like, oh, all right. <laughs> No, I, those the, we definitely had a few nights where like we definitely would show up a, a few deep and then like start talking about like some movies and stuff and then you know you show up early so you get in for the discount or for the whatever the whatever specials going on and then like you check your watch and it's like oh it's midnight already oh there's like hundred people here all right well I guess we'll <laughs> I guess we'll just go do something else <laughs> yeah good times good times all right um also joined by uh by Izzy who uh his his, he has a TikTok, a horror TikTok, which I didn't know even was like a, a you know, a subgenre of TikTok, but like oh, yeah. makes sense now that I know that. Um, horror talk, baby. <laughs> I'm also joined by Karthik. He's been joining uh, Left Flank Vets for uh, Revolutionary Tracks, which is a, a music like podcast episode that how often do you do it? Like weekly or? Um... Bi-weekly. All right. Bi-weekly. Uh, music episode or music themed interview episode with uh, Left Flank Vets, which um, is pretty amazing. I mean, we've had we had uh, Lorax from Left Flank Vets on to do the Past of Glory episode, and I feel like that's like, you know, that was that was one of uh, that was one of the best episodes I think we've done, and it was because he like knew so much about um, well, you know, they they have such like opinions about uh, war and you know and, and the, the you know life as a vet and all this different stuff so having him on i think really helped our, our situation there i really wanted to get into talking about that uh that that well the birds but also that trailer is pretty fucking incredible i think hitchcock and, always had like incredible trailers to his movies there's somebody that like doesn't like trailers like he was really quick to like here's my movie here's the point here's yeah. this and that's it like goodbye like it's just like right. super simple no shots spoiled like very very to the point and dry, which is great because it's the exact opposite of like what his movies usually are. Yeah. And and I think that um, you know, I think not spoiling a shot is obviously important because, you know, as the master of suspense, like, you know, I, I, like the shots that are the most incredible in Hitchcock movies are the ones that are gonna spoil the suspense, I think. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So he ends up scripting a, a movie like he ends up having to script a movie trailer that doesn't spoil the suspense for anybody. And then it becomes its own, like its own almost play. You know what I mean? And I feel like Hitchcock kind of, his movies are like plays in a lot of ways. Like the ways that he, the way he crafts them, I think um, you kind of, and, and the way he markets them, you feel a lot more like you're watching a, a more intimate, like play than you are um, a movie, I'd say. Even the exchange that they have at the, at the kind of car um, where um, I think she's driving away from the island for the first time or like she's driving away from the uh, Bodega Bay for the first time and they have this quick kind of exchange which is almost bordering on absurd. Like they, it's supposed to be their like kind of first flirtatious kind of romantic over the first obvious exchange, right? And then their first, quickly, over, the like, pants, evolved, their first over the pants exchange. <laughs> right yeah <laughs> and like and and it quickly devolves into this kind of almost fight or like quibble and then uh it it it's kind of like uh affectionate but also uh kind of mean in a way and uh, i feel like that that exchange is perfectly um, and it and it encapsulates like the the eeriness of the whole movie like there's something weird going on the whole time and you can't put a finger on it following right after uh doing psycho um, I think where, you know, the whole movie, you feel unsettled 
Um, sorry that I'm spoiling it for the the people that uh, this is their first first uh, Hitchcock movie, I guess. But the whole movie, you feel unsettled by Norman Bates. You feel unsettled by the whole situation. But you can't. I mean, like you know, you think that the mother is obviously the one running around killing people. You're unsettled. Like there's the final reveal where you realize it's Norman, like dressed as the mother, running around killing people. Having a character at the center of a story like that, who uh, the entire movie is based around making you feel unsettled, not knowing why, and having it be a character. Um, Hitchcock, I think, is clearly his his uh. You feel unsettled by every character in this, and then it turns out that every character is kind of just like a person. Like, there's no, like, he builds up these relationships, I think, between these characters where you feel like, all right, like, something's, something weird's going on here. And kind of, I think, the, the big suspense, I mean, one of the big reveals in, like, uh, at, at, like, the 50-minute mark is that, like, no, like, there, it's just birds attacking. Like, there's no, there's no deeper, like, there's no deeper characterization where it's, like, somebody calls the birds or, like, you know, the birds are really attacking because someone's evil or, like, someone's causing this. Like, the birds are just attacking. You don't know why, like, and go. So it feels like the movie kind of starts at that point. Well, I think that this is, like, a unique Hitchcock film because it's one of the few times where the antagonist or, like, the source of um, conflict for our characters is not another person. Like, it's very rare that Hitchcock films deal with outside of, like, mm -hmm. personal relationships or personal circumstance. Um, which to me adds a level of deepness to his film. I'm actually really not a big Hitchcock fan. Um, I, between this rear window, like, and even Psycho, I don't even put up there, but I don't find his films super, you know, I don't, I don't, when I sit down and want to like enjoy a movie, I really don't put on a Hitchcock film just because of like how cheesy some of the stuff can be. But this film, you don't, you me, don't just throw on uh, North by Northwest or something well, like that and just go, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to chill. It's time for some uh, some time for some Hitchcock. Well, it's interesting because you say North by Northwest, but that's like the perfect example of what I'm talking about. There's that like iconic scene where like he's about to meet the guy that's like going to tell him like, OK, like, oh, let me help you out. Like, I'll get you out of whatever. I, I'm trying to remember the, the plot point. Um, and he's like, oh, I can clear up. And then like somebody throws like a knife at his back and then like the guy dives and then he is trying to reach and grab the knife out, but it looks like he stabbed him in the back and the whole crowd turns around. They're like, <gasps> it's like, like, I, like that stuff, I'm really like, oh, okay, whatever. But like the birds really takes that like person versus person element out and really makes it like people versus nature, which I think is much more terrifying um, yeah. or much more, um, much more suspenseful in a way too. Because you and never know what's going to happen next. But animals are so unpredictable. It's uh, it's funny because the last episode that we did on Tuesday was Planet of the Apes, which kind of has a very similar, um, like a very similar theme, which is like you know humans have fucked up the planet and the planet is retaliating. Like we we constantly disrespect nature, and now I mean you know obviously Planet of the Apes nature has overtaken us, but in this sense you know it's just one town. Like it's the uh, it's the ISIS strategy. They're taking it one town at a time, I guess. <laughs> so um i you know so it's it's it is very interesting um and you know my thought today was i was watching it for like the third time because i watched it you know twice before this and um i mean i've watched it you know like probably like 15 or 20 times since i was a kid like hitchcock was the first hitchcock was like one of the first uh horror directors i feel like as a kid that i could get into because like you know i would put on something like a slasher film or something and my parents would be like whoa you can't watch that but as like a little kid i could put on like a you know a Hitchcock movie, and they'd be like, "Well, this is art." You know what I mean? So, <laughs> this is filmmaking as it should be. So this you know, filmmaking one hundred and one. <laughs> so I have like a ridiculously large collection of uh, Hitchcock VHSs, and I still have a VHS player. But apparently, the one that I can't find is the birds. I have like I don't know. Like I I tweeted that earlier. Like the collection of it, it's just like a stack, and it's like pretty much every other. Like I think I have, I have four copies of Thirty Nine Steps on VHS, and. Hmm. I, I don't know. It's weird, but um, yeah. So I, I think that it, it is. It is rare. It, it's incredible. Like it's really an exclusive uh, Hitchcock movie in the sense that like the people don't turn out to be the the villains, or a person doesn't turn out to be a villain. But I and today my thought was when I was watching that it was because I think Psycho literally had focused on that to like to like a a, a point where it's like all right, like we got it like the shy the shy quiet mama's boy guy is like a fucking killer like you know what i mean like a serial killer like you know so i i feel like hitchcock moving away from that for this movie really does feel in context because you know it's three years later um three years like you know in, in <laughs> kitty um no it, like in, in context um it really it, it really feels uh yeah, like like he's really trying to do something 
the complete opposite of what you'd expect, which really is the point of um, suspense, I think. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he, he wants to leave you in suspense. And, like, what's the best way to leave you in suspense? Have 50 minutes of characters having this, this weird interpersonal drama where every single person looks potentially like they could be the person that's, like, somehow causing all of this to happen. Like, you know, like, like the mother is obviously um, afraid to be abandoned and is kind of obsessive about killing her son's relationships. Both the son... You know, um, and and like his uh, his new Paris Hilton like girlfriend, <laughs> social aid girlfriend, um, they've been lying to each other the entire time, and you start to wonder like, is she some kind of con artist? Like, is she it, like, is her fortune real? Like, is she really on the like? You know, what I mean, the, the, the suspicion of it is like accentuated by the way that Hitchcock shoots it. Um, mm. So like, so every character seems like they could come under suspicion, and then the the big reveal is that like, you know, none of these like none of these characters are actually suspicious. They're just like weird people with like emotional and you know codependency issues, and you know, but like in the end, they come together, they rally, they get the fuck out of there, like, but like you know, and and the rest of it isn't explained, um, at all. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Having never seen a Hitchcock movie before, um, I did think it was interesting that the first fifty minutes is basically just an interconnection of speculation. Everybody has an idea or a theory about everybody else. Um, but it is interesting that he kind of interrupts that speculation for um, just just kind of a freak of nature where birds are attacking people and f- flying through uh, walls. Um, I thought some of the acting was a little cheesy. Um, there's only so many times you can stand there scared with the daughter and run from one wall to another before it's like, eh, you should probably pick somewhere else to go. Um, and, and then you find out it's only their town. No, yes. other, no other towns are affected. They, <laughs> if they had just left Bodega Bay. Right. It, well, what I also found the most, um, I had a little epiphany while I was watching it. And I realized if somebody had ever come to ask me before or after watching this movie, uh, come and ask me, Hey, what would you do if birds were attacking i don't think anybody has an answer for that question yeah. like what what do you what do you do and you know and like towards the end that radio broadcasting thing was um talking about how they're gonna have to send in the army or something it's like what you know <laughs> the army against the birds <laughs> so it's like we, we we have so few solutions that we're gonna just send in the army so it's also kind of a um yeah. uh, it's kind I mean, of a what reverse, are they gonna do uh, it's, it's a reverse war of the worlds, right? Yes, Where right. in the end, like the the you know the birds are the solution, and this like you know, but like when the birds turn on you, like you know what I mean? Humanity was saved, and the birds saved humanity. All right. right. So then right. the birds turn on you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. What, what, what are they gonna do? What are they, what are they gonna do with the military? It shows up, shoot the birds. I mean, they're just right. Yeah. Out. It's 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 just a bunch of hunters. They let them loose. <laughs> like monster movies, you, you tend to have uh, you know like the the monster uh, would end up being some sort of allegorical or like um, a metaphor for some kind of um, uh, interrelationship that, that is portrayed on the, you know, among the characters. But in this case, like the monster is a complete externality, as you kind of pointed out, uh, which is kind of like interesting because it makes you wonder what the b- birds even represent because they, uh, it's, it's an easy kind of like, and even in the trailer, like he makes the point that, um, it's supposed to be kind of like a nature against man type of um, situation, but it, it also kind of like uh, the question such as why didn't they leave the bay? Why didn't they uh, just go to a different town? What about, you know, that kind of place and this attack is like, uh, why is it so specific? Uh, kind of like makes us ask uh, whether the birds are just like some kind of arbitrary environmental kind of uh, uprising or if it's trying to portray something a little more uh, specific than that because like and, and, and again like uh, even on the point of uh, it being very different from Psycho I think I would also ask the question of like Psycho is supposed to be um, the unconscious kind of coming to the surface and having and, and fully you know manifesting itself uh, here you could argue it's the same thing that's happening except it's not happening in the form of a human but like a total uh, third party element like kind of like Venom from uh, Spider-Man 3 it's like this total external element, but it's it's totally uh, kind of complementing everything 
uh, about these people because their lives are completely boring and like uh, lazy and nothing really significant is happening that they have to make up these kind of you know um you games to play with each other a, a, a socialite who is the talk of the newspapers has shown up in their sleepy fish, fishing uh, Bayside town, and you say whose daddy is owning oh, the newspaper? By oh, the way. a lot is happening in this in this sleepy <laughs> town. Well, to, yeah, to I mean, point. like she, she almost uh, goes into a fountain. Uh, like, yeah, she she goes into a fountain um, and like jumps into a fountain naked and all that, right? Isn't that uh, um, <laughs> supposed to be the tabloid moment? It was scandalous, and it made the it made the gossip columns, and everyone was talking about it. Which, by the way, that event is totally inspired from this movie right here, and I'm just gonna make sure that that's very clear. Jumping into uh, Trevi Fountain in Rome, um, but to that point about why the birds are um, attacking this specific place, and right when she shows up, I mean that woman in the diner even says like, you know, they didn't they weren't attacking until you were here, like. You know, what What did you do? Um, I think the film is very clear. Well, let me start off with this. I like to look at things very retrospectively. Um, personally, I think Hitchcock read the short story and was like, hmm, Bud's being scary. I bet that could be a great movie. And then <laughs> and then just elaborated on that. He also, he also lived near Santa Cruz where, I mean, they reference it, but in 1961, a bunch of birds, and I have the headline for late. I was going to pull it up later on, but a bunch of birds literally went crazy, started throwing up everywhere, dive bombing cars, dive bombing houses, dive bombing people, and nobody knew why. He didn't figure out why until like 2012. Um, mm. That like so, so we we can talk about that later on. But yeah, no, I think it's those two things together. Well, and and I think a, a lot of uh, some of the things that I caught onto the film, and I, so I watched it years ago, and I've watched it like three times this week, and I even have it on in the background right now as we're talking. Um, I think that something that is not as talked about as much in the film is the hints of like uh, feminism, especially in the way in the age of the second wave feminist movement in America being like two or three years before this film. Um, there's a lot of elements that I think the birds represent kind of like the old way of how we saw the natural world versus um, the new way of women finding their own empowerment and um, feeling more uh, individualized, which is also signified by um, uh, Melanie always wearing green. So she is a figure of nature just as the birds are. And these two, like it, we say that it's people versus nature, but it's almost nature versus nature in a way of like, you know, this old idea that, you know, women aren't supposed to jump in fountains. Women aren't supposed to do whatever they want and uh, enjoy life and, you know, drive all the way to this place to sleep with a guy and do it by delivering birds. Women are supposed to be like the mother figure and take care of kids and, um, uh, provide for the husband, even the wife in the uh, when she's bedside talks about how she still wakes up and wants to like make her husband breakfast every day. Um, and her fear is about being abandoned. And now that she's lost her husband and her one child has grown up, it's her other child's birthday. That idea of her job of being a woman is almost a completion. And she feels like when that's done, then there'll be nothing. Um, compared to Melanie, who's very like, I'm just gonna do whatever the hell I want. So I think that the the element of nature versus nature there of like, you know, this is how things were done and you're challenging that versus, well, this is who I am and this is what I am gonna do because I'm a free person, I think is an interesting dynamic that the film presents um, very well, of course, looking at it um, and, the 2021 and I think line. To that exact point, well, um, there also seems to be a, a old money, new money uh, dynamic going on here where it seems like, um, you know, it seems like uh, they're kind of old money. Like it seems like their house is very nice. They're living in this, weirdly enough, um, very, very uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, New England wasp town, although it, it happens to be in Northern California, which everybody has like Boston accents, which kind of weirded me out. I don't know if anyone else noticed that. Like, we're like, yeah, like, you know, like they, they have this like, <laughs> Yeah, the Mid Atlantic accents yeah. was, but like weird. It, a lot of times it wasn't. A lot of times people seem to have um, like Boston, like Maine accents. No. They have like the the slight like Maine, um, like like or like or uh, not Boston, but like Cape Cod, like that kind of old, yes. old money. Um, yeah, Mid Atlantic. Yeah, the sort of the 
the proper kind of like the the lady that we run into the main first. well the main characters seem to have that accent oh well, yes right people people in the actual town seem to have like a, a slight like almost massachusetts um tinge like at least the guy like oh. the store owner like that kind of, so they seem to have like this like it's almost like this this could be transported to like cape cod or something that this is happening and you know what i mean like or like martha's vineyard or something like that like there's a very old money atmosphere to it a very waspy atmosphere to the town and um you know melanie daniels her her, her father owns the newspaper but she seems to have a very uh nuevo rich uh <laughs> as they'd say attitude towards life and she's just kind of a socialite like you know, like in a way that really existed in the 60s that I, I don't know if uh, really existed before that. Like she's just going and they, they seem to even imply that she's just like, you know, she's just kind of just hooking up with guys and like Rome. She like stops herself from saying that when they're, you know, in front of the car. She's like, well, I was doing plenty of uh, and then she like changes the subject. But like, you know, it's this, it's this new attitude where, you know, she's a she's a very bohemian um uh, in some sense, uh, Nuevo rich socialite. So there's like almost like a both a generational and like a, I think a a new money and old money dynamic going on. Um, I don't know if anyone else caught that. As a, what, what what I kind of feel like is is like um, uh, interestingly this time um, I watched probably uh, when I was like half my age right now, uh, 14, 15. And like, uh, I remember thinking that it was like some sort of, uh, that the birds were kind of like the enemy. This time I kind of felt like a sort of solidarity with the birds. And I felt like <laughs> they were kind of representing uh, the, the feeling that I had at the 15 minute mark, because like, you know, th there was nothing really, like I said, like the, there was not really much going on, despite the fact that like all of this uh, socialite venturing out into this, uh, you know, a quest to, uh, uh, give the rose to her or get the rose from her bachelor or whatever um, and like at the at the end of it all like you're kind of hoping for okay your lives are not really kind of representing uh, the the sort of at while on the one hand uh, possessing all of the qualities of uh, feminist uh, movements like kind of uh, showing the interrelationships the complex kind of characters of the of the women involved um, at the end of the day, uh, I don't know if any of you guys caught the scene where uh, the kid kind of calls, uh, he's kind of like a public defender or something like that. And she says that he hangs out in the hood or something. No, um, he, and, so and what, just like, what, what the kid says is that the guy she's, he, the, all right. So the, the, the kid says, um, I actually wrote down the quote. She, she, she says, uh, the guys, the people he defends are hoods, meaning like they're, they're criminals, like just by default, like she doesn't. And you know she's like an eleven-year-old, so like you got to take it with a grain of salt. But she's saying like, no, I, oh, like, yeah. But but the point is that like you know um, the the birds seem to be completely. Uh, she says, she says I know all that. I know all that democracy jazz. They're still hoods. <laughs> yeah, uh, but at the end of the day, the birds seem to be sort of like uh, attacking them indiscriminately, uh, regardless of their like so-called uh, you know um, actualizations of uh, uh, womanhood uh, in every every possible way. Like, uh, good for you that you're a socialite you, who was able to jump into a fountain in Rome. I'm still gonna, you know, like, uh, peck you on the head because you still get that uh, from the birds. And, and he said, it, it also kind of like, you know, uh, the whole expression of giving somebody the bird also comes to mind. Like, yeah. I, was, I just couldn't stop thinking about the whole idea of the birds as a, um, as a sort of fuck you to the, uh, class of people that it's uh, attacking. Well, it's like watching, you know, watching the birds as a lib versus watching the the birds as a as a socialist. Like, you know, when you're when you're a lib, you're like, oh no, I hope they're okay and their personal stories are good. And then, you know, as a leftist, you're like, no, indiscriminately attack everyone. Fuck the socialite. Fuck old money. We're out here. You know, we're gonna we're gonna burn it all down. But um, I wanted to bring uh, I wanted to bring Izzy into this because he hasn't said uh you know very much yet i wanted to get his opinion on uh yeah so uh birds i think it's a very wholesome movie a lot of it's so weird if it, it feels like there's a lot of like character development but it's like character development that they're like all sus as fuck yeah <laughs> yeah like it, it, it's funny so um and at the same time i just at the end of the movie I, i'm just like left like i don't know like on edge like 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 almost like sopranos because like you don't know how 
the birds can be killed or what they're going to do to like, you know, take out this population of birds. Like usually during horror movies, you know, evil entity, you know, the, the person killing everybody, you know, there's always like a weak spot. So we don't really get, we don't get that with the birds. Like we don't like they're, they're like we said earlier, they're calling in the army. It's like, okay, what, what, what does the army do up against like hundreds and thousands of birds, you know? Well, so like town. <laughs> done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, it's just we, we don't know what's going to unfold. Like, will they ever be defeated, or is, is this it for everybody? Is it going to spread? We don't. We yeah, don't know. No, that that was the point I was about to make when you said, like, is it like, is it contained in this one town? Like, are the birds suddenly going insane, or is it like a, going to be a global phenomenon where all of a sudden, like, you're just kind of, uh, you're you're just, you know, the whole world is taken over by birds. Like, you don't know. But like, also, I mean. So that part of it didn't exactly make sense to me um, until I was reading today about the fact that it really did happen in Santa Cruz, which is what they, which is what they, uh, what they reference in, um, you know, when they're when they're in the diner. And it turns out in Santa Cruz, it happened. There was like a, a couple of days where birds were just bombing everything, and then all of a sudden it just stopped, and, and nobody could figure it out for fifty years. So I mean, to Gianni's point, I think that he made earlier, where it's just like you know, he, he reads it, like Hitchcock reads the story and goes, "That would make a good movie." Like, it, also like in a town that was very near where Hitchcock was living at the time, like it literally happened, and Hitchcock's like, "Huh." So I'm gonna I'm gonna play a I'm gonna play a clip, I guess, to get us back on track. Um, Let's do it. This is this is uh, Hitchcock talking about uh, the difference between uh, a whodunit, a thriller and a suspense uh, movie in his, in his imagination, because this woman that's interviewing him um, accidentally, uh, I think calls what he did, what he does a thriller or something. And, and this is his response to it. So I think it's interesting. Speaking of sexiness, you deal a lot with uh, sexual aberrations and fetishes as subject matter. You feel this is a good subject matter for suspense? Well, suspense is, it doesn't relate really to that. Then why would you Suspense use these? relates entirely to causing an audience to go through emotions and, and can only be arrived at by giving them knowledge. Most people get confused between the mystery story and the thriller and the suspense story and the whodunit. See, well, the whodunit, the oh, there's a big difference. The whodunit, you see, is a... Uh, intellectual exercise like a crossword puzzle when you mm-hmm. buy a whodunit you're terribly tempted to look at that last <laughs> page and you don't because you feel you've wasted your money or be disappointed but the suspense story is giving the audience full information before you start in other words there is a bomb under these seats tell the audience mm-hmm. that and they will scream out and say get out of there get out of there how about in Notorious? Could you uh, describe the build-up of suspense there? Well, the sus- no, no, that wasn't really... The suspense there was, how soon will Claude Rains find out that the woman who was the daughter of an old friend is an American agent? We all know it. Mm-hmm. We were told at the beginning that she was working with Cary Grant. Then you had the added fact that Cary Grant was in love with her and yet in the course of his job he literally had to put this woman into the arms of another man. Now that was your emotional story but your suspense story uh, which built up to its climax when they just then in the process of which you come to the moment when says mother I'm married to an American agent. Now they know they've got to get rid of her, but they've got to get rid of her surreptitiously. Can't just bump her off because all the rest of the, his colleagues will know. So you get a case of arsenical poisoning, you see. Who is your idea of an ideal villain? I've heard you read somewhere that you thought the Claude Rains kind of personified well, he was the a ideal. nice man in his way, you know. I think any. Any man, uh, uh, as you know, uh, as you've seen the film Frenzy, you've got a cheerful, lively man who is a, is a psychotic. You see, unless they're pleasant and, and acceptable, their victims will never go near them. Most people misunderstand what a villain is. He's a charming man who kills women. 
<laughs> but if he didn't have the charm, they'd run a mile from him. <laughs> well, that brings us back maybe to sexual aberrations again. Uh, you, there seem to be a lot of Jack the Ripper uh, types in various of your f in various films. Well, they're only they are aberrations uh, for the by the fact that um, outwardly they're uh, acceptable members of society. And in the picture frenzy, I agreed to go to some extent in the scene between a doctor and a lawyer to explain that fact that outwardly they're normal, uh, apparently decent human beings. And then, quote, it comes over them, unquote. <laughs> you do use humor. Uh, do you think that that plays a kind of relief from the building up of suspense? You'll always need it. You, know, you can't it's like just a bomb keep... situation. If you have the bomb, you must never let it go off because if you've created suspense with the audience, then you must relieve it. I kind of feel like he's uh, talking about himself a little bit where he's like, they're perfectly normal human beings, but, you know, it comes over them. Just you like know, <laughs> I want to make like a serious point on how like you can see the um, influence on Taxi Driver from just that interview. But I also want to make a joke of just like he sounds like the first like Joaquin Phoenix Joker. <laughs> you know, sometimes, oh. you, sometimes you think a woman's in love with you, but it's your own psychotic imagination. Way. You just have to burn everything to the ground. It's the same we live in a society <laughs> of suspense. The suspense in that case is is the world going to be burned down? Not probably. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be me that does it or the other 15 jokers at the end of the film. How would I know that? You're, you know. <laughs> but um, to talk seriously on this point, I, I, I think that uh, that, it, that was a good, uh, I mean, obviously, he's a fantastic filmmaker and inc was incredibly um, knowledgeable. But I think even if you were to compare his films with the more suspenseful films of today or even of recent, in recent, I mean, like past his prime, you know, like Taxi Driver or something like all throughout Taxi Driver. We know Travis Bickle is is one like one event away from becoming this like awful uh, menace to society. Um, and you're in every time you watch it, you're like, which one's going to do it? Or which one's going to do it? Which one's going to do it? And that is suspense. Yeah, you know, that's like true. And, and, I, and I think, up. in a very uh, Hitchcockian sense, I guess, um, the the ending of uh, Taxi Driver. Sorry for all the spoilers. I know it's only been like forty years, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, the end of uh, the end of Taxi Driver is that he doesn't get punished for his crimes. Which you you know you assume that even if it's like it, I don't know. I really I enjoy Taxi Driver for the reason that if one thing had been different, he would be like a, a, a criminal that was, you know, sentenced to the, the maximum amount that anybody possibly could. He killed a presidential candidate. He would have been, he would have been like, you know, your, uh, your Lee Harvey Oswalds. He would have been something like that. You know what I mean? Like looked down on by society for so fucking long, sitting in jail for the rest of his life, if not executed. But the fact that, you know, he decides at the last, or he, he's kind of pushed away from that point And he's like, oh, I guess I'll just kill a pimp so I can rescue this 12 year old girl, 12 year old Jodie Foster over there. Um, mm -hmm. Like at that point, all of a sudden he's hailed as a hero in the hospital and he doesn't face any charges. And like the, the suspense really, it, it is thinking that he's going to be killing a politician. But once that doesn't happen, you're like, all right, where is this going from here? And it goes to the point where it's like, no, like as a vigilante, like we're, we're going to reward you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like crime is rampant. It's like, it's the seventies. Like, you know, like you're, you're going to get a reward for this. And it's like, holy shit. The difference between killing one person and killing like six people, but also, you know what I mean? Like going on like a rampage, but also it's criminals that you're killing. Like the, the difference between those two things is is like mind blowing. I like the I like the kind of comparison with uh, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker because I feel like um, the the Joaquin Phoenix Joker killing the mom in the hospital is basically the the killing the mom that happened in in, in Psycho um, essentially uh, or like the kind of death of the mother uh, figure or like the kind of author maternal authority um, that is breaking before he goes like full anarchist. Uh, which is kind of like the the same kind of suspense that you you're talking about with the uh, taxi driver as well, because it's kind of like as much as it's a sub suspense, it's also a subversion, like kind of the attack or or, or the or the kind of violent event that's happening is actually 
causing a kind of uh, release of the tension and also like a, a sort of uh, liberating experience in in a way uh, each um, attack or murder in 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 all of these cases like not through the release of the tension also signifies like the the character achieving some sort of higher plane of like um, knowledge or like some some uh, greater um, accomplishment is taking place in the within the scheme of the story um, i feel like something something if you draw that pa- a parallel to, uh, to birds um, i feel like it's it's like the i mean i i said this to you forest in the in the text i feel like it's kind of more like the suspense is the when is what's going to be the final straw for the class war to break out or or something like that so when is yeah. the when are the birds going to go in for the kill um to actually um cause the rupture in the system because they kind of like slowly take one shot here and there um you know one bird even uh, fails at like getting into the door um yeah. hits the door and then dies um Actually, so it's kind of like I have, a point, I have a point about that is it's kind of hitchcock um at the same time nadi does being like don't worry there's going to be birds like you know oh no but like you know what i mean like it interrupts a, a very like a very deep like very passive aggressive but also open emotional conversation because at the end of the movie you realize none of these relationships that he's built has ma- have mattered like the thing that mattered yeah. is that 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 birds have attacked the town like the plot of the movie is that birds have attacked the town you know hitchcock kind of fucking with his audience is waiting 50 minutes and building these really fucking boring relationships so that the payoff is that birds start attacking people and none of them matter which you know Hitchcock's entire career has been spent building relationships just for one relationship or two relationships to turn out to be um you know like to turn out to be the the relationships that really matter and to like move the plot and like kind of just be a twist but in this case he he builds the, like it's it's like he's building a jenga tower and then no one ever pulled like you know what i mean like the thing that the thing that pulls it out is that a bunch of birds fucking attack the jenga tower like there's <laughs> you know what i mean like it's like well 52 minutes it's like you wait for the first bird attack like the first bird attack happens when the social socialite character melanie gets uh you know attacked just by the on the forehead yeah right well, well um all right well i was going to say the way i kind of saw it was um it was almost like the birds at least to me it didn't seem like they symbolized anything it seemed like they were there to take the symbolic sort of landscape that was developed in the first 50 minutes and just kind of turn it over yeah. where where you know um because i i think that um i don't know it, it's almost it's almost uh, to me it all, it's almost like the birds didn't have any symbolism at all like it, it's uh, almost a it's it's almost a nothingness that 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 just uh is brought in to um reveal that the symbols that we have or the things that we read into things are just things that we're making up because like the first 50 minutes like I said before was kind of just this continuous people being like oh I bet this is going on about this and you know and even in the diner scene you know you have all these people with the different theories the world's ending no it's just birds whatever but all of this sort of gets uh sort of doesn't matter and sort of uh i don't know it it it's almost like the birds don't really symbolize anything it's almost nihilistic you, you in in one interpretation anyway i say like i think the idea is it possible that the birds are just a macguffin i mean absolutely it's alfred hitchcock he is notorious for making macguffins you mean a macguffin <laughs> yeah. making a macguffin out of this one too. <laughs> uh but but I think to say that the birds don't signify everything. I think the film do- does hint at the fact that Melanie is there is significant. You know, and not only that Melanie is there, but any time like the first time there's a bird attack, she has just l- breached the house of the person that she was there to visit. Um It, the second time birds attack she's getting it's her like getting closer to the people of the town the third time is at the birthday party and it's even clear that um that the school teacher even points out it's like okay that's three times so that means that it, it it's not a coincidence you know there's there's a significant targeted 
um, attack going on in, in the context of the film. I'm not talking about like in the real life situation of these characters. And then for the fourth time, and this is something that I picked up on my second viewing of the film, and one reason why I, I take such a strong stance towards like the um, the 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 second wave feminist kind of point uh, point of view is um, if you watch when they talk for the fourth time, it's that night after the birthday party. And um, again, like it's just, it's, it's happens there. And then, it, and it is suggested that that same night they attack the guy that the mom was friends with um, that like got the feed from the chickens. Um, but if you, when the, when the cop comes to the house, um, him and uh, uh, Mitch are talking for a while about why the birds are attacking and they can't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Like, what could be going on? What could be happening? Not this, not that, not this. The whole time the mother's picking up the broken pieces from the house, you know, and trying to bring her life back together. As soon as they stop talking, um, she adjusts the painting of her dead husband. Yeah, and a dead I, I, bird. Saw, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, uh, a, a de the dead bird it falls and scares her. You know, yeah. It attacks her in a way. And I think that adds more significance to the idea that um, essentially, like these women are constantly um, misunderstood and um, being still, still in a way haunted by the uh, misogyny that they were living through, these older women I'm speaking of. And the presence of Melanie threatens that once thought of natural um, way of doing things which then upturns the way that um, society and what we thought was natural and what is natural um, is true. And it then subverts our expectation of, um, of uh, what the birds actually are. So in a way, like we were talking earlier about the birds being like, you know, finding some class solidarity with the birds, I kind of feel more like um, they're like the meminists, like chads and chat kind of like, <laughs> How can you, you know, say that about the birds? Yeah. The birds. No. I, no, no. The opposite, I had the opposite take on my third watch through, which is kind of funny because that was earlier today, and then I was trying to rush to get clips together and stuff. But my my take was that um, yeah. So so my 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 take on on the entire thing is that Melanie is the MacGuffin, uh, showing up because in mm -hmm. in, in my in my take on this um, and, and I wrote I wrote these down. So there's like three tropes that end up coming back in pretty much every animal attack movie and that have been in monster movies in the past. Like, so there's these three, the three tropes of like the ornithological lady obviously represents like science, like science can't explain why the birds are attacking. And in real life, you know, looking at um, that bird attack that happened in Santa Cruz, um, uh, you know, science, uh, science can't explain why the birds are attacking for 50 years. You know what I mean? Like, so that like that makes sense. The second thing is religion, like the, the preacher that's drunk. That's uh you know, the preacher that's drunk that's just kinda like the end of the world. So the woman's just the woman all she can tell you, um you know, all she can tell you is that there are species of birds, how many birds there are, and what birds sometimes do, and like the thing about the brain paths. And science has failed at that point. All and religion can do is tell you that the world is ending. Religion has failed at that point. Then kind of a fascist mentality uh, kicks in where the guy's like, all right, we'll, we'll just kill all the birds. Fuck birds. You know what I mean? And then the last thing that happens is that the general town's population responds to the, the fascism of it and just goes, uh, it must be this. It, it must be this woman that's causing it. So I thought her showing up kind of is the MacGuffin because I, th I thought Hitchcock was kind of making the point that when there is no explanation, which I think I think. Hitchcock's point is that there is no explanation. I don't think the birds necessarily represent anything. I also think that Hitchcock wants you to transplant your own uh, vision of what the birds represent because it's terrifying. You're seeing something truly terrifying that nobody is explaining to you. Throughout the entire movie, no one's explaining it to you. Just like in life, when birds attacked people in Santa Cruz, nobody explained it to them because they didn't have an answer. It could have been anything. So I think what Hitchcock is doing throughout this movie is, is making the point, I guess, that, that, that there is no answer to it um, giving you, he's giving you these institutions almost like science, religion. They have no explanation for it, and the reason that they have no explanation for it is because it's never happened before. So you know, I mean, all religion can kind of do is theorize at the fact that you know the world is ending. It says so in this ancient text. Look, there's one thing that doesn't even relate to this about birds. Mm -hmm. All science can do is tell you there's this many birds. 
there are species of birds. These species are different. Look, we looked at a bird's brain one time. It's not very big, which if you know anything about crows, is not true. Crows are the smartest bird. Like, you know what I mean? So it's, it's very significant that it's the crow attack because crows are actually birds that can solve complex problems. It's like the one bird that can. So she's like, well, you know, a bird, like, you know, like, like a bird might, you know, it, birds aren't very smart, so I can't see them doing this. That's all science can tell you about it. All fascism can tell you about it is let's kill all the birds, like mm -hmm. the militarism of it. You know what I mean? So, so like all together, like it's everything has failed you because this is an unknown and it will always probably be an unknown because it's not something that's ever happened before. So I think what Hitchcock is kind of fucking with the audience about is like, how do we, how do we perceive things? How do we respond to things when there is no explanation for it? Right. Um, and I, I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's what I was trying to say in a better way. Definitely. <laughs> um, I, I also think the whole part where it seems like uh, everybody starts blaming Melanie for things. I think um, in, in kind of the uh, setup where every time she does something, something happens. I do think that's a way of fucking with the audience in the sense that it's it's forcing two things together where it's kind of forcing you to kind of engage in a scapegoat where it's like, oh, it's her fault where maybe that's just messing with you. Maybe it's it's to show that how easy it is to make that connection, even though that connection may not actually make sense. Yeah. I feel like we're kind of uh, having, having a lot of uh, discussions around why it means nothing. Uh, but at the same time, it, the, the fact that uh, there is at the central um, plot element is, is a lovebird uh, a pair of lovebirds getting, uh, you know, uh, caged by this lady and uh, being gifted to uh, this man as a sort of offer of some kind of uh, affection or love as a sort of building a relationship. And like, it's, it's like an actualization on the part of the uh, of their romance, right? Like their romance is kind of budding and the birds are supposed to represent that. But at the same time, the birds are being held captive uh by these people why as a sort of just gesture of their romance and all of that and like I, to me it like creates the perfect conflict for the birds to actually attack them and and yeah. like kind of and in a very straightforward way literally that's what is happening like the birds are angry that you know that that your entire purpose of uh, raison the i don't know how that uh, the reason to exist in french uh is basically you know caging two birds and uh, sharing how uh, you know they can't live without each other and finding some sort of meaning uh, in your life through that uh, experience of caging these two birds and i feel like that kind of sets up the conflict as a sort of clear uh, you know clash of some sort of two two sides here like because clearly the, uh, the one side is imprisoning the birds and the other side is attacking the side that's imprisoning the birds it's like a um, as, it's, as like as birds, it's like the birds it's kind of like a response to the birds though because it's like they're looking at the the, the crows and the and the birds that are attacking are looking at the lovebirds that are in that are in the cages it's like this is our response to being somewhat imprisoned uh we're just going to attack the people that are are imprisoning us uh it's like my thing is like this is like when very, in very nature marxian. very marxian in, in a <laughs> in a solidaristic sense yeah, like, um, this is kind of like when nature is attacking back. Like, the whole thing that I got from the movie is like, you know how we say things like, hey, we're going to eat a lot of crow? This is like the sense of, like, <laughs> there's the crow eating us. Yeah. <laughs> In a figuratively speaking sense. Like, I mean, the fact I, I, think, I think that you're right about the fact that, um, and I think Karthik is too, that you're supposed to feel some type of solidarity with the birds. And I think that's the most straightforward reading, is that, we literally do every possible, like even in that trailer, like we do every fucked up possible thing to birds. And now birds are like, we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to attack you. So I think that that's the most straightforward reading. I also think that very purposely it's left up to every possible interpretation of why the birds are attacking because it's never explained. And it's never explained why it's just one town because they're like, oh, well, I assume birds are attacking everywhere. The radio gets turned on. Nope, just your town. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and and they do they do leave that uh, point up to it where every time there is a a bird attack the lovebirds start singing so mm -hmm. it's almost like the lovebirds are calling for the other birds to attack but at the same time you see at other places where there aren't lovebirds but I mean I guess you know the guy that has his eyes pecked out there's chickens there 
But like, you yeah. know, like, so it's not necessary. So there's a lot of things. I think this is, uh, I think this is Hitchcock's ultimate McGuff- MacGuffin film because literally everything could be, and nothing could be. It could just be a straightforward case of birds are sick of getting attacked or getting uh, caged and eaten. You know what I mean? Like. Well, I think I think that the idea that the birds mean nothing. I think if if we're talking about what Hitchcock intended, that is a very realistic chance. Like the birds, the birds are attacking, and the real fear, the real reason for the film is Charlie's cat keeps hearing birds, and it's like. <laughs> Um, but so the reason they're attacking is not necessarily as important as what happens when we don't have an explainable reason why something bad is happening. Exactly. And, 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 exactly. And, and, 100%. Which, which right. And, and if we're talking about in the mind of Hitchcock, like, and, and also what the film is telling us too, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not a, a good interpretation. And I find it interesting that we're watching or we're analyzing this film and having that mindset while also living in this COVID reality where, People are uh, caged up because of a natural disaster, essentially. Um, and their causation and blame for the restrictions or some of the things that are happening to them aren't necessarily about what actually caused their imprisonment, but more the response. Like they want to point fingers, they want an easy answer, where the answer might not be as simple. It might be more complex. Um, and, and, everything's, and everything's failed them at that point, you know. Right, like, absolutely. Like, who do who do we look for for answers? We look to science. I really I came up with this theory today while watching it and felt like, you know, I felt like mind blown by it. But like, who do we who do we like turn to? We turn to science, and science <laughs> can only really tell us either what they've studied or in the past what's happened. So if something happens out of nowhere and you're asking for a scientific explanation, science is going to be like either like, oh, that can't happen, like. You know what I mean? Like there's scientific rules like that, that, that can't happen. I'm sorry. Like not, maybe not like a, like a, you know, like a scientist that really wants to study something, but just in general, like science is a concept, you know, something's never happened before. Science can't explain it. Religion kind of does go to the end of the world. It's like, you know, all of these things are signs. The, the world is ending. It must be a sign. And then there's like a very militaristic, uh, like, well, there's birds attacking you. Why not just kill every bird? And then science responds, like, you can't kill every bird. There's too many fucking birds. Like, there's billions of birds. How are you going to kill every single bird? And the militaristic, like, mindset is, like, just do it. Like, just kill every bird. Like, if you can. Every bird needs to be gone. So it's, like, this this constant tension that you're being given this thing that, like, no... I'm going Cuomo again with the full hand gestures. um, Watch your webcams. Watch your webcams over here. (laughs) <laughs> no, like, so you're given this, you're given this, like, you know, you're giving up, you're given a problem, I think, in this sense, that has no answer. And there is an answer now. And apparently, it's a, a much weirder one than I w- would have fucking expected. And we can touch on this at the end. That's going to be the big twist. It was me. I caused the bird. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I think it's a I think it's a perfectly postmodern film where it's all about the perspectives and no one seems to have an answer and answers seem to contradict each other. Um, uh, I'm I'm a bit of an existentialist. I think that's why I threw in that the, the birds might mean nothing. Because and that's why you commented on my meme post last night where I said, uh, I, 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 I am a cynic and I, I can't help myself, but, um, yeah, well, I, I was going to say, so my use of the word nothing though, is, is kind of like what Forrest was saying, where it's, it's just a place for the projections of the individuals. It's not that the birds literally mean nothing. Obviously they mean something. Otherwise they wouldn't be flying through doors, but, um, I, I do think it's kind of uh, interesting to relate it to COVID, though, where we're seeing people who, in fact, have information on a situation are still projecting their particular thoughts onto the world and, and sort of interpreting things in a different way where maybe, you know, uh, the birds kind of are a, are a prediction that even with science and religion and things like that, people would still not be able to uh, 
re- resist the uh, tendency to link to things that might not actually be linked, which but may do we, be. Do we really have information? I mean, you know, I, I think COVID is a perfect example. Like, did we really have information? Like, scientists can't tell you where COVID came from. Like, well, right. right. Well, well, I there, would say that I, I would say that we have some information. We it's have some kind of... information, but it's left up to what like kind of what your both political and uh like what what your political uh and and i guess uh research agenda is in that case. well right and, and that's why i was kind of relating it to the birds because in a sense you have an object information but it doesn't really matter that it's there what matters is is more or less how you how what, what you're projecting onto it so like you know you go through the different stages like you're talking about where you know you you ask religion and you ask science and then you kind of go to a militaristic thing and it's almost like showing um at least the way i interpreted it as well is that it's almost showing that within technology and advanced societies you still have that primitive base where we kind of react to things not by whether we have information about or whether the event's happening we kind of have a uh, almost, I would say, almost primitive response where we're just we're just looking for answers. Yeah, no, I, yeah, mean, I agree. One an answer. We're we're, uh, Gian, I'll just let you. I just want to make this one point. We the thing that we want is an answer, and and the fact that we can't have an answer in the age of information. But I mean, this movie's obviously before that. But like making that point before that, the the the, the fact that we can't have an answer is like incredibly infuriating and just you know like literally leads to fascism in some cases because we're just like, you know, the only possible answer can be violence. Let's eradicate the problem. And, and I think, you know, to add on to both your points about it represent, uh, uh, comparing it to COVID again, looking at it uh, retrospectively, let's, let's like rewind the clocks back to when, um, when we first experienced COVID, when America really got hit hard and the lockdowns happened, you know, Compare that to these birds are attacking. It's not a coincidence. This is actually something big that's happening. You know, you turn to science. Science doesn't know because science doesn't have the tools to find it out that quick. It needs more time. You know, you go to religion and they had their way with it. And then at that point, we we start to, like uh, RC was saying, we go back to our primitive mindset of, okay, causation. All right. uh, It came from China. It's the China virus of those racist uh, terms and um, connotations start becoming more clear and clear. And Melanie and the goes the through military, that. Military industrial complex, um, like provably before the, the, you know, COVID started, um, had produced papers about how they wanted to uh, pivot the strategy from the Middle East to China. So the fact that, you know, it, it like might have come from China. I mean, well, it did like, you know, what I mean, the fact that they can say pinpoint it and say, this is where we decided that it's come from fits in with a militaristic perspective of for the rest of our, you know, for the next, whatever, 40, 50 years, the only other superpower in the world is someone that we're going to have a cold war with. Um, obviously we can't really have a cold war because economically we are literally the, the twin snakes, but like, you know, like in, in this right. case, like how can we fear monger about this? Well, the fear mongering in this case is that, you know, that, uh, that it came from China. China either has a biological weapon China is irresponsible. There's a bunch of different ways you can take that. But the fact that there isn't an answer leaves it open for that third possibility, I think, um, in the birds, which is kind of funny that it can be that closely put into it because it's like when something doesn't, when there's no answer to it, because all, all, all science can really tell you in the case of COVID is like, well, in 1918, the Spanish flu happened. And here's how we handle the Spanish flu. You put on masks, like, you know, these things happened at this point, like, in the summer, which proved like was proved not to be the case, but you know, in the summer, uh, because it wasn't flu season anymore, the 1918 flu dropped off pretty much for a little bit. And so that point for science is like they can tell you that, they can tell you to wear a mask, they can tell you how not to spread germs. Science doesn't necessarily have an answer for where COVID came from right now because the evidence isn't there, which makes sense. But then, you know, religion you know, there were plenty of uh, preachers preaching about, you know, why COVID was happening. And then the third one is fascism or militarism or whatever, you know, whatever you want to project onto that one guy at the bar that's like, we should kill all the birds. And in this case, it's like, all right, well, our militaristic foreign policy kind of needs China to be our enemy for the next, because like our, our, like the military industrial complex is 
hard for fucking China. Like China is is a is a is a a second superpower that for the end of time probably with the amount of money that both us and the Chinese government uh produce could be someone that we could we could fight endlessly. That's our like that's our arch villain right yeah. there. You know what I mean? Right. Uh yeah. that that makes me think of um Gore Vidal talking about how um since the National Security Act in 1947 we've always had a an enemy. First it was the Soviets and then, you know, it's been, you know, terrorists and now we're looking at China. Um which terrorists and, are kind of a which terrorists are kind of a, a trash enemy because yes. you, you just keep making up terrorist groups or, or propping up terrorists groups right. as we did with ISIS. Like, you know, what I mean, prop up the idea that this is the big terrorist group that we need right. to be fighting right now. Like you you can be uh you, you like you can argue that endlessly, but at the same time, like you have to keep like kind of propping up these terrorist groups. With China, you don't have to do that anymore. Right, China, exactly. Literally, there's someone who has an economic standing that they can probably go to an endless war with you. And so right. many people that, that the, the thought of going to war with them is terrifying. That is like for the military industrial complex, that's their, I don't know, that's their. Well, the, well that, that's, that's that's what they need because the military industrial complex. Is it their MacGuffin? Is, <laughs> no, the ISIS was I, I, well, well, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> it, the the military industrial complex to me is kind of a economic you know an economy of lack where we we require an object to continuously throw money at the military and um i've noticed that the more in debt we go the more we spend on the military which is always interesting because yeah it means it means our prosperity is quite precarious but to bring this back to uh is it is it Gianni? Am I saying that correctly? Um, to bring it back to Gianni. Gianni's point about um, feminism, you gotta, say, you gotta say it as Gianni. I, 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 I don't know. I, I'm pretty. I respect Jewish. that. I, 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 was gonna, I was gonna say I, I'm pretty Jewish. I'll try, but um, <laughs> I'm also drinking back... wine and wearing a pinky ring, so you know I'm really just <laughs> asking for it. Um, but but to bring it back to Gianni's point about uh, feminism. What's interesting is if you if you make that parallel, which is a very interesting parallel, and you relate it to what we're talking about, where we we develop primitive uh, projections onto situations, whether we have information or not, you you start to notice that when they start making um, Melanie the uh, scapegoat, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of showing that no matter how much we progress on social issues. And this might be a postmodern kind of pessimism, but no matter how much we progress on issues, we're going to come back to certain people, certain you know groups that are targets. Right. And so what? So it's the outsider itself. Right. And, yeah. And so yeah. as so even with the progress, the progress is only as good as the crisis or as the lack of crisis. Once there's a crisis, you start to project. And and I would argue that it's uh, not in the way that you know dumb people like Joe Rogan use it, but like in the way that it probably should be used, tribalism as a concept. Like the idea that like it, it's, it's a tribal sense of suspicion that like, you know, you're a, you're a cohesive unit and the new element to the unit, because things have changed and you don't understand them, you know, the new element to the unit uh, is the thing that's to blame for that. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that that, I think that there's, so I think there's a big three that uh, Hitchcock is, is touching on, which is obviously science, like, religion and then like militarism but then the fourth one kind of comes up when all of those women are staring at her and there's like that very and uh i actually like took a whole bunch of uh um like screenshots when i was watching earlier so i think i have that one as as, as a screenshot to look at later because i didn't know whether gianni was gonna come equipped with uh a million a million <laughs> comments about angles but um hmm. you know i i i just i think that in that moment you know the 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 failure, you and me both, Johnny. Those, <laughs> the failure of all of those <laughs> all of those institutions result in a, in a primitive a, a primitive um, I guess residual sense of uh, suspicion, which is something that's existed since the beginning of time. I mean, you know, no matter where you go, I mean, you know, Italy, the homeland, but, <laughs> but you know, even in even when science could explain things, kind of a lot of uh, you know a lot of the more papal. Uh, uh, people loving Italian uh, people reverted to that kind of thing. And, right. it, 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 you know, all, all three of those things kind of all three of those other uh, factions failing kind of reverse us to a thing where, number one, it, it is like, you know, in, in a very primitive sense, 
this thing has changed, so this must be the culprit, is kind of a logical jump, let's say, mm-hmm. right? On top of that, the religious jump, obviously, is like, God is mad at us, so he's brought this person to us. Mm-hmm. The fascist jump is like, you know, like like the outsider is is so kind of in the way all of those institutions, if you take it down to their most base sense, uh, that's kind of, you know, a, a conclusion that you can reach from the three of them if they fail to give you a, a, a more modern interpretation. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I, I was going to say that. Um... Ah, I lost my train of thought here. Hold on a second. Um, shit. <laughs> Somebody else say something. I'll you, see, I was about to say, do you mind if I just quickly? Yeah. Um, so when when we talk about, uh, oh. I, I'm I'm not too big on eugenics or the study or the um, the falsehoods of it. But eugenics if, on me. <laughs> but if you if you do notice, um, a lot of that island is full of blue eyed people, and the threat of these outsiders, um, uh, Melanie, and then even the school teacher, who remember is not a native to that land, and it's very clear that she is an outsider. You know, it is it is very clear that there are physical distinct differences from the mem- from the people of the island and people that are not of the island. And Mitch plays an interesting um, character of someone that's kind of halfway, of someone that spends a lot of time in San Francisco but visits. Um, not the island. I'm sorry. The the um, the bay. Um, he spends half of his time it's in San Francisco. The, the, the bay. <laughs> the bodega in which they're all encountering. Right. It's just, well, it's just I, one big bodega. Right. Um, well, I was I was gonna say. So first off, I remember what I was gonna say. Uh, that makes me think of what uh, Vol- uh, what you were saying, Forrest. Makes me think of what Voltaire said. He said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself; people do. And we got a we, we got a polemicist here, and he's we gonna- do. You're gonna take um, down a philosophic rabbit hole. <laughs> well, ba- basically, I mean that's kind of how I how I read history is that people tend to repeat themselves, and mm. and in what sense that is, it depends. Um, reversion. But, I mean, reactionary reversion in this case. Right. Well, exactly. I, I think that you know, I, and that's a point that uh, philosophers have made since like the beginning of time. Kind of is right. is about you know. That, that reversion, but yeah. Yes, exactly. And, you know, it, it makes me think of a, a TV show I've seen recently, Avenue 5, where basically the whole point of that is to show that no matter how advanced the technology gets, we as people are going to still be the same weird, ridiculous animals that we always have been. And so in, in the birds, it's kind of the same way, but I, I think it kind of goes with the social uh, critique that, uh, Gianni brought up where it doesn't matter how much we've progressed we've um, sort of when, when things get difficult when there's a lack of firm information or really you could even say firm customs that progress is going to be questioned and we're going to revert to uh, primitive projections um can I just say, like, the one thing with, like, all these deaths are going on. It's like, so, like, Suzanne, Su- Suzanne Plachette played the teacher. And she's, like, the one probably shocking death in all of the movie, as far as I can see. Next to the neighbor that had his eyeballs taken out by the by the crows. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And um, I, I think it's interesting. Um, I don't want to go too far into psychoanalysis. Um, it's only fun sometimes, but, um, there's a British psychoanalyst known as Wilfred Bion. I I don't know if anybody's read his stuff, but, um, it's interesting to watch or listen to the people talk on the Island about the reasons they're there because Melanie and the school teacher were there because of love, which Bion would call pairing, you know, you're there because, you know. You're, you're looking to find a mate. Um, he has two other categories, which is dependency and fight or flight, uh, for the reason that people on an emotional level form groups. And it seems to be that as things break down, they kind of go through that cycle of different emotions, where at first there's dependency, you know, they're, um, you know, they, they kind of, uh, It, 
th- there's kind of a dependency where where um, I actually I should put it this way. It shows up mostly in the diner scene. First, there's a dependency where you have the the ornithologist. I, I don't think I said that right. Um, the scientist who everybody starts to rely on her information, but then it slowly but surely just kind of seems up. more like a bird watcher than a ornithologist. Yeah, 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 just yeah. just a, a pretentious bird watcher. Yeah. Um. Uh. But everyone starts kind of relying on her answers as she speaks up, and then she doesn't quite have all the answers. And then she you has have no answers. She literally well, exactly. only has statistics that someone at, like Audubon Society or whatever the fuck can tell you. Like well, literally, like right. there's this many birds and there's this many species. She's literally just regurgitating out. Right, right. Well, yeah. I, I should I, I I use the word answer in kind of the more definition definitional manner where it's like she she has answers. Doesn't mean that I they're necessarily I got away true from, or helpful. From this level of discourse by not doing <laughs> Ben's show right now. But I guess uh, um, but uh, well, well, they start relying on her. And then you have the guy who's saying it's the end of the world, and that's kind of the fight or flight sort of response, like you know, and and you could kind of lump in the other guy who uh, uh, was talking about oh, just kill all the birds. Well, he's all fight, right? Like in the yeah, fight or flight yeah. response. I mean, both science and religion are kind of the flight op. I mean, well, no, science right. is kind of just the denial option, like just well, say, yeah, the, the yeah the depend the dependency is is what. Bion would call it. They're kind of dependent upon whatever it is. They're just like, oh, this is not out of the ordinary or, oh, this is the end of the world. Yeah. Um, and the fight or flight is the guy who says to kill them all. Um, pairing doesn't really... I, I mean, pairing technically plays here in a primitive sense because everybody starts to bunch up and they start, you know, trying to take the children away and sort of the... Um, well, they go... I mean, just all, honestly, on, a, on like almost like a, a Marxian level too, like, you know... The, the dynamics of it are moving down from from group group to group. So like the community kind of fails. Like on, on a national scale, obviously it's failed. The community right. kind of fails. They're, they're taking it down to the to the smallest possible unit, including getting rid of the one um you know the teacher who kind of is is you know you can project as like kind of extended family like to the point right. they never help out with like you know like raising the kid like to that point she's cut out of the picture. All right. they have left is literally the the dynamic of a family unit. I mean, you know, not that like, I mean, they're you know they're mates, they're the lovebirds. You know what I mean? Like, so she doesn't really have to be uh, any kind of like married into that family unit. But at this point, like, the, she's been moved into this family unit, and at that point, that's all you really have in this situation. Right. Um, every other, because it's because you see a failure of every possible. Um, and I mean, I like that uh, Hitchcock isn't heavy handed about this. Like, he could have gone like, "Oh, here's the military." They don't know what to do. Here's the government. They don't know what to do. But instead, it's on a very local level. Right. So, like they're literally just sitting around a diner, being like, "Oh, what do we do?" And they're like, "I don't know." So you've seen a, a breakdown of every single level of, which which is a subversion of all of Hitchcock's previous work, if you think about it, because there's the constant suspicion that breaks down families. There's the constant suspicion where one person in the family, like nobody knows, uh, you know, like like that person's evil. Like he was talking about it even in that one in that clip we watched. You know what I mean? Like the the, the wife doesn't know that, or you know what I mean? Like there's the, uh, like a marriage and they don't know the other person's a spy. Like he's talking about that with suspense. Like the breakdown of all of those things was suspense is constant suspicion and cynicism. You know, like and you're sitting there feeling that way the whole movie. Like, and, and after watch, I mean, I've watched Psycho probably like, I don't know, 15 times in my life. Like Psycho is a movie that I've watched a, a grotesque amount of times, uh, no pun intended. And, and like, you know, the, the thing in the end is that like, this guy seems devoted to his mother and the, the big reveal is that his mother, he killed his mother and is pretending to be her. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's the breakdown of the family unit, unit on like a, mole- a molecular level at that point. Right. Right, well, and so yeah, you see, the, you unit see. Is the only team that manages to persevere enough to, in in their one specific case, probably get away from this. Uh, right, you see the failure of all institutions, basically, mm-hmm. starting starting with the failure of the national institution, which doesn't even play part until it's too late. <laughs> but um, to th- the, the, to, to know, change the scariest uh, the scariest phrase in the English language. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. <laughs> Ray, Ray, Reagan would be proud. Yeah, um, well, I, I haven't been able to go a single episode without a Reagan reference, so I needed to yeah. interject. Well, uh, Gore, Gore Vidal used to go uh, night, uh, late night show to late night show, making fun of Reagan's hair. 
So it's, it's probably it's, cut him to the core more than anyone that actually had like a problem with his political policies. Yes. Um, you got to stop platforming Reagan for us. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, if, if you if you have me on more, every time he platforms Reagan, I'll platform the doll. And we'll have Reagan's power. ghost. <laughs> Give Reagan his due. Oh, He's dead. God. Dude, um, RC, I'll help you in that platform of the doll. Yeah, there you go. And, and you know, it, it's I'll, like... I'll uh, do the platform of Marx as well, because I'm... Oh, there, there, the there you go. You you see, you're talking to Marx. The only ghost he, I could contact is Reagan. <laughs> you, 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 you see, terrible. You, you, you have... terrible. Every time I say anything about, you know, even even vaguely liberal, let alone fucking socialist, Reagan comes down and he's like, well... well and he's like, Ra- right. Ra- it's like... It's like Family Guy. He just comes down. He's like Reagan Smash. The truth um, is, I've it's been like... stuck in the. The truth is, I've been stuck in the General Electric house, uh, for for the last you know for the last twenty six years of my life. I can't get out. I'm trapped. I've never been able to leave. I, I try to leave, and then you know executives from General Electric push me back in. So the, the, this is why he likes Hitchcock movies. His life is just full of suspense. <laughs> it's he never like knows it's like kind of. Escape. I guess it related to like the whole like there's a stand up comedy uh, stand up comedy with Dana Carvey where he's talking about the Reagan Oracle about who's going to be the next president. It's just like really holy. Um, You're stuck was, in that in that dimension, Forrest. I was going to say one of the the funniest things. Uh, yeah, one of the funniest things uh, Vidal said about Reagan was he came on to the Johnny Carson show and he uh, he started off. I started it off by saying, we have some bad news. We wanted to let everybody know that the Reagan Library has burned down. And all two, all two books didn't survive. <laughs> and, and, he said, and he said, the worst part about it is the president didn't, the president didn't have uh, time to finish coloring either of them. <laughs> so, See, you have me. I thought the punch time was going to be the two books. <laughs> I mean, the, the, thing that's really, the thing that's really fucked us is that Reagan's library, you know, the Reagan library is two books. Trump's library is just the McDonald's menu, like the dollar menu. And like, you know, the, the, the dumbing, the dumbing down of, of like an already stupid reactionary movement has been awful. And Bush couldn't it's, read. So there you they, go. My 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 inner cynic ha- has a lot of fun watching these people. I, oh. I, I, I wrote I wrote in an article recently that. uh <laughs> If if all the far right people stop getting the vaccine and COVID takes them out, I don't have to listen to Marx anymore because it wasn't the revolution that took out the fascists; it was COVID. Um, I feel like we're just we're we're shedding guests because you know Izzy left when we were uh, you know I mean that's not why he he left, but he left when, we, when I was roasting militarism. Carthy just left because we just went too hard on Reagan. You know, we're really, um, we're really, I mean, really weeding out all of our reactionaries. Well, uh, it's, it's also making me realize why I only have like three friends. Maybe I just I keep oh, shedding them. Come on, you have three <laughs> friends? <laughs> Not really, but um, nevertheless, um, <laughs> we become friends, kind of. I see through I, Facebook. I, I, I would, I would say so. We pe- people have virtual friends now. It's uh, it's easier for, yeah. for neopets. <laughs> Yeah, they're Tamagotchis. Like, if I forget to feed you, I'm sorry. I just want to see how long you go until you die. Um, <laughs> Is that why your cat's begging friends? for food right now? What? No. A little, a little nervous. Are they friends? Are they friends? Are they Sims? We don't know. We don't, we don't know. know. We, 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 we cannot confirm or deny the sources, but... Um, yeah, three friends. <laughs> um, and as for my cats, I fed them twice today. They, oh, those, they, yeah, those are the you have three. Yeah, all right. So that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> they 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 have wet food. They're, they've had t- wet food twice. They've got a food gravity thing that they knock over constantly. The problem with having cats as friends, that I learned the hard way, is that you know if you forget to feed them for a couple hours, they stop being your friends. Yes. you have to keep feeding feeding the the cat friends, or else you know they they quit on you. They and, come and into cat. a feral state. Kind yeah. Of. Well, also the bad thing about naming um, one of my cats Ahab, which is a very famous literary character for those who don't read. Um, famous. I from uh, from Moby Rockhard Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the song, not the book. No. Um, <laughs> every, every every time I get mad at him, I have to yell at him, and then you know. If I ever have to read about Captain Ahab again, I, I feel like I have to, I, I'm yelling at the captain. I'm like, stop it. Quit it. Actually, Knock so it this, off. Is, this is a perfect point to bring us 
back to the birds is yeah. I see that Moby Dick is is literally, I guess, uh, you know, Moby Dick is kind of a proto version of this story, which is interesting. The next animal attack movie that obviously exists is Jaws, like, you know, the, the next right. thing on the line. So which Jaws, I mean, Jaws is pretty much Moby Dick. But like, you know, at that point, we're like, well, much more fierce. No, one, no one's going to make a whale scary. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, well, point, yeah, yeah, right. Like the, the, the whale, the whale's kind of a, it, it's scary because it doesn't think very much. And so it'll just crush your ship. But and because, <laughs> and because it's fucking huge. Oh, like, exactly. Why a whale is scary is because they're literally like, you know, the biggest fucking animal. Like it, it, it's like being, it's like being afraid of a, now. We yeah. Have, well, you can't scare someone with a whale when you have a plane that could just fucking drop a bomb on a whale. Right. <laughs> this is true. And Why it's it, kill all whales. Anyway, um. it's 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 kind of it's kind of it's kind of like being afraid of a tall, a really tall person in a small room. Once well, yeah, you open yeah. the do- once you open the door, it's not like this. Six, I have a brother that's like six seven. So yeah, right. <laughs> and and it's it's an interesting precursor, and this allows me to to plug my favorite movie, which is The Edge, because that that follows in the line of animals being, you know, horrible to human beings. Yeah. Although that's about a bear, and you know, which this, but this is kind of the first, uh, you know, the birds to like to bring us to that subject is the birds right. is kind of the first in the long line of movies that we've had since then, and and it's been a popular concept in literature because you know when you read a book you don't necessarily have to visualize in, in the way that you do with the movie like visual like obviously I'm I'm reading a book like I have a very visual mind like I, I'm imagining something but it, really it is left to the imagination in a way that in movies obviously it can't be. So right. it kind of feels like Hitchcock is leaving this to the imagination in a way that can't exa- exist in literature. And it is uh, like the, the film, it is the first real film uh, response to uh, books like Moby Dick. That right. Kind of create the, well, the animal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, um, it's very American because a lot of American literary works have animals attacking people. Um, but it's also very not American because, it, you know, it's, it's left without, you know, that's why I only read books that Joe Rogan recommends. Um, <laughs> yeah, they, I'm I'm only so smart because I take all those brain pills. Um, <laughs> uh, brain force. <laughs> Which I'm glad you I'm glad you got my message to promote that because as a sponsor of our show. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I, I I don't think I don't think I could ever be on Joe Rogan's program without Me heavily either, he- heavily offending him. Me either. Oh, I thought I thought you mentioned in general you couldn't be on it. I oh, I geez. still I still uh absolutely thought the the funniest thing that came out of TMBS like working, uh you know like two years for for Michael. I mean you know I, I miss Michael all the time because it felt like his his uh and and he felt like this too, but it felt like his platform was really growing because Joe Rogan called him Michael Roberts, and so he had a clip where he had, like he was just, he was fucking dying laughing because. <laughs> Rogan said, you know, Sam Cedar, Michael Roberts, and he just started, he, like, the fact that, like, uh, Joe Rogan had mentioned, clearly mentioned him, but, like, without knowing his name, he, like, had created a character named Michael Roberts, that was, like, his Oh, uh, God, my, my grandpa's name. Within a name, day but... of that happening, though, he created that character within a day of, uh, of, of Joe Rogan mentioning his name. <laughs> my, my, my grandpa's name. I Mike saw Roberts. it now, that was, God. like, my right, Well, yeah, all right, oh, well, I... God. Listen, Michael didn't cause that to happen. Joe no, oh, no, no, it's all good. Uh, last <laughs> thing I want to throw out there, and I have not seen other Hitchcock movies. I know of Hitchcock mostly through the articles on psychoanalysis I've read. All right, so, so you pretty much watch Hitchcock movies. <laughs> I, pre- I don't know. Um, but basically, <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a point made in one of the, the articles I was reading that there's usually the appearance of milk in Hitchcock movies, yeah, like there's like human, 11, 11 of the like movies. He looks like the human equivalent of Mel. Like he looks like yeah, a human interpretation. Pretty much. Yeah. And so I, I thought it was interesting that it's not in the birds, but I don't know what the significance that has. So I'm going to throw that out to you guys since you guys have well, seen I, I got I got something. I got something right here for you. It's a, it's a pipe bomb and it's under your chair right now. No, <laughs> I, have a, I, have a, I have a clip to... to, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a clip. I have a clip to play because this is this is amazing. Oh, uh, Dick Cavett. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You uh, you called actors cattle once in your career and um, offended a few. Well, of them. I think at the time, I think I said I was accused of calling actors cattle, mm-hmm. and I said that um, 
I would never say such an unfeeling, rude thing about actors at all. What I probably said was that all actors should be treated like cattle. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And, and you went on to do that. Uh, In a nice way. Yes. <laughs> Fed them at the right hours and uh, brushed them occasionally. Well, uh, you, uh, I, I know you, um, what one actress got you for that somehow. By She once uh, had some cattle brought onto a set or something. That was a famous name. Carol Lombard. Carol Lombard, yes. yeah. And she was a woman with a great sense of humor. And I arrived on the set the first day of shooting, and she would had a corral built. And in it were three live calves with the names of the actors on big discs around their necks. Um, wow. If, if I'm good to just jump in there really quick. Uh, I was going to talk about the aesthetics of Jaws and um, the birds and how Hitchcock adored Russian montage and editing. And you can see it in the birds very clearly. And, and Jaws extremely um, was influenced by it. But the other thing about Hitchcock is he is like one of the last, and when I say one of the last, like, I mean, going into the 60s and 70s, he was still making films and was still well regarded. Um, but he was one of the last old school filmmakers. Yeah, old, that, old, old Hollywood. Um, yeah, yeah, one of the last old Hollywood fil um, directors that were like, nope, I don't care what you think your character would do. I'm telling you to do this. If I want you to walk over there and stare at a window and you don't want to do it, I don't care. I'm the director. I tell you what to do. I'm going it's to dump hot lava on you. <laughs> well, I, all right, all right, I'll, I'll counter it with this. Um, there are definitely filmmakers that come within this time period that subscribe to that, that don't necessarily um, have that have that power but there are filmmakers who subscribe to that like dictatorial um, um, vision. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola is a perfect fucking example of it because hey, hey. he said during his filming um, yeah, Apocalypse Now, he said uh, so, like he, he said that you know society is kind of breaking down those like those bonds of like power. And he said the last dictatorial, um, which is my my film nerd quote of the day, I guess the last dictatorial uh, relationship that you can really have is between a director and an actor. I like it's uh it's fun it's it's funny that you say that about directors because uh Gore Vidal wrote an article about working in the Oh my god, um, is Gore Vidal paying you? <laughs> yeah, yes he is. It's how it's how I it's the how late I can, Gore Vidal. It's it's how I can uh, afford yeah, late with those such a nice, that money at <laughs> it, it's how I can afford <laughs> such a nice one bedroom apartment. Um no, but he was talking about uh he, he made a, a snide remark. He said that um, directors see themselves as the author of the film, but everybody else sees them as the uh, brother-in-law they don't really want to talk to. <laughs> so it's it's interesting that you're talking about you know directors who don't listen. You know they they have dictatorial power and and I just I, that's the quote that popped in my head. May, maybe they are dictators. Maybe it's true, but apparently some people treat them like brothers i mean I, I don't know interesting interesting point i guess and i feel like this might be what gianni was about to say but i don't know uh tippy hendren who was the the actress in the birds hitchcock kind of had an obsession with her and ended up i mean i don't know she claimed in, at least in her memoir in 2016 that hitchcock ended up sexually assaulting her in a dressing room because he was like enamored with her and he was willing to like he, he was trying to throw away his marriage and and just assumed that because she was first so in the birds uh you know, this didn't happen, but in Marnie, which is the next film that Hitchcock had made, which, you know, he had like a kind of two film, uh, two film deal with her, I guess. And she starred in both of them. Um, in, in Marnie, he t walk, like kind of walked into the dressing room and sexually assaulted her during the filming of it. And so it, it's kind of like this, this, and then, you know, famously, obviously he was throwing birds at her, which, you know, is what you do when you have a crush on someone. You just, you know, you just, you know, you're like a 12 year old and you just throw things at them until they, the, 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 Greek, the, the, Greek the other shoot. irony of this is that Tibby Hendren was an animal rights activist. <laughs> yeah. So. But, yeah, which makes sense. I mean, it's not irony. The kind well, of if you wanna if you wanna perceive it in that sense, the birds is kind of an animal rights activist movie. Like it, it is uh, something that jives with that because literally, kind of the point that Hitchcock's making throughout that trailer. I mean, the most straightforward reading is we've killed, caged, maimed everything you could possibly imagine, hunted birds for too long. And birds are now striking back. I think right. that when you know when this movie is being written, 
there's a million interpretations, but like if you wanted to go with just the straightforward, like the most, you know, A to B interpretation that you possibly could, like we fucked with birds for a very long time. Hitchcock says it in the thing. There are hats. There are like there are dinner. There, you know, because he's like even unthinkingly just like eating a, a bird. You know what I mean? Like so, it's all these things combined. Like we we kill birds. We kill so many birds, just like we do with everything. But like birds, very specifically in that time, because I don't think anyone would dare to wear like a, a hat just that had a dead bird on it now. But like you know, in in the sixties, like if you were high society, one sign that you were high society. I mean, one of them was furs, which is already you know we're mammals and and you're wearing a mammal which you know which she wears in the film that's her coat that she brings to the bay but the other thing is a lot of people that were rich uh you know even in the early 20th century would just have birds on their hat like just dead birds like imagine you know so the most straightforward reading is like birds see that there's a, a socialite walking around birds see that and they're like yo we need to strike back which i don't think is the real reading of the movie because the movie goes in depth on so many other levels but the reading that you could have in that sense is like, we've killed so many birds that birds are uh, ready to, to, to kill us, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, I think the only person who wears furs and stuff now is, uh, the, what's her name, Anna Witter or whatever, the, the lady who inspired Devil Wear. Devil no, wears there's, uh, I know, I, I've met plenty of girls that wear Oh, I, I want, want at least want one fur. Well, I, I should put it this way. You, you said that they wouldn't wear the feathers. And yeah. I, I, I feel like if you told that to her, she'd take it as a challenge. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think I think you could wear feathers, though, and, and not necessarily kill a bird. I think when it came to those, I mean, I think people do for feathers, but I'm saying, like, I don't think that necessarily is like, you, you know, you could find enough feathers, I guess. technically. Oh, I, I, I was just I was just trying to call Witcher evil, but oh, I was just trying to tell you that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I was trying to tell you that I've been killing lots of birds. <laughs> I, I just really wanted a quick. Um, touch on more just because my background is more in, in filmmaking and, and stuff like that. Um, his use of montage in this film, I feel like, is very unique to how else he's done, like North by Northwest and Rear Window and things like that. You can see how he edits and how different it is from like some of those films. Um, very specifically, um, the the scene where uh, they where the mother walks in and sees like her the person that sells her the chicken seed and how she essentially sees that trauma which I think is a very real um, a real interpretation of how you process trauma at first hand you don't see it you know in like you know life slows down and sound effects increase you like kind of see it and it takes your mind to process it and you go through like these skips. And in the same way, the film jumps from like the foot to the head to closer to the head to the eyes in a very effective way. Um, and then he does this again later on at the school when you see crows sweeping in, one is lining up to the bars, two is lining up to three. And then, all, you know, you're like, OK, so next time it's going to be like four or five. And then you find that that shot of the bird coming and boom, there's like a hundred cranes, uh, excuse me, a hundred crows on there. It's a very effective way of montage. Again, he was playing around with a lot of um, some of the Russian um, editing techniques of the early 1930s, uh, late 20s. Um, but I, to end it on more of like a, a comedic note, I think that he overdoes it in a way because one of the last times he does it in the film is when that car explodes and you see <laughs> You see, like, the, he wants to be all, like, technical with it and, like, make it, like, this artsy thing with Melanie, like, looking this direction, watching the flame drag, Melanie looking the other direction, and it just seems so, like, okay, we get it, dude. Like, you watched a Russian film in 1920, from 1925. Like, it, it's, it, you made your point. Like, you're, you're going a little overboard here. Um, but I do think it's important to recognize that he was playing with the medium and at, at, at such a, um, experienced and non-fearful way he was caring about um, playing around with like different techniques and stuff like that inspired from other filmmakers. Yeah. So the, I didn't know how prepared uh, Gianni was going to be. So I captured um, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of shots uh, that, that I, that I liked in it because I thought maybe Gianni was going to pull a Kale Brooks and send me like a folder full of shots um, and then do a four hour stream. So, you know, I wanted to be somewhat prepared um so this is this is the this is the you know the scene where 
Um, it, it zooms out, which honestly I think is hilarious. Uh, this part of it because um, I, I think it's honestly one of the one of the funniest parts of the movie because you know you see this and it's already it's already fucking terrifying to see an entire town kind of starting to be engulfed in flame. And I and I think it's you know going back to because it's right after that diner scene that we're that we're talking about for you know a long time. Um, the, the diner scene where they're kind of responding to this unknown factor, and it's like, all right, well everything's broken down even the fascist element of it is broken down what happens well you know a, a, a guy you know the guy drops uh, a cigar and the whole town catches on fire because the the obsession with having to know the answer or like having to have an answer to it um just leads the town to kind of get destroyed but the the funniest part i think um in this scene which i was because I, I watched it this third time as a you know i i really wanted to make sure that you know however prepared gianni was i was on his level like i didn't you know so <laughs> So I watched it a third time today after watching it twice, uh, whatever. I did a very, cl- like, took a lot of notes. Like, I have a whole Google Doc with a bunch of notes that I didn't end up using. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I think that this this is the funniest scene to me because you see this fire and then you see a bird and then you see a second bird and they're just birds right in front of the camera blocking your, vi- like, your view of a town burning. And it's like this, like, the town burning is probably the most interesting thing that happens to the town in the entire movie. And it's like, well, why don't we just add some fucking birds? Like, you got to remember, like, you know, because the birds aren't causing the fire. The unknown quantity of uh, being in a situation where no one can answer the question, you know, ends up causing the fire. Nobody has information and the chaos explodes and the birds actually don't do it. Just as like, in some ways, I don't think the birds, I mean, the birds quite literally kill people. But like in the sense of like, you can see someone get pecked a bunch by birds they don't fall down or something. The birds don't overwhelm them and the person kind of survives. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the lack of information, the chaos in some ways is what's killing people um, in that sense. So it's funny that there's just like a bird that comes in front of the camera and then a second bird and then a third bird. Uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting that the uh, birds attack in waves, that there's moments of peace. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if that's the show. That's that suspense. When you build suspense, you need those moments of, I, I I I hate tea. I don't I don't want to talk about that. If, uh, if I, <laughs> if, go ahead. Do, do you mind if I? Okay, because well, one Forrest, if I knew I could send you a folder, I would have. Yeah, I didn't definitely. tell you for that reason. <laughs> I mean, if 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 we ever do a, if you ever do a um, taxi driver bicycle thieves, like you know, no, I, I got purposely didn't indulge. Well, I know I think I think I might have quickly, but the information that uh, I told you about the four hour Kale Brook shining stream. Where yeah, yeah. On, on Ben's show, where it was his birthday, and he was just hammered, and Kale sent me a folder, and then every time we strayed away from his folder, he'd be like, "Yo, the folder though." Like, <laughs> I, don't, I purposely wasn't like, "Hey, Gianni, send me a folder," but I do have a bunch of shots from this that I did want to get to. Um, you know, I mean, we're we're getting close to two hours, and we cut it off at two hours, but I do want to talk about this movie a lot because I've seen it like a dozen times. Well, <laughs> I mean, I would I would love to talk about aesthetics because to me, this is the most interesting aesthetic Hitchcockian film. Mm-hmm. Um, but even this shot is so it tells such an interesting story because there's not another shot like it in the film. Yeah. Hitchcock is very dry bones. I want my I want my characters front and center. Da, 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 da. But notice, like you said, that chaos was only created by the humans' um, unknowingness, by their by their um, fear, and because of how. Um, um, how they've reacted to things, while which also case, their ignorance to their outside the world. The movie, and I think that um, in, in different shots he alludes to it because you yeah, know yeah. the thing that the thing that ends up killing people isn't that a bird attacks them, the same bird attacks them, the same. The thing that ends up killing people is that in their fight or flight response, going back to that part of the conversation, birds overwhelm them. They're overwhelmed by birds, and well, they're overwhelmed. That, like if there was an answer to it, they knew how to fight back. There is no answer to it. They don't know how to fight back. They're overwhelmed by the bird's very existence. But but to even add on to that, like so, what caused this is a bird hit a person in the head, and the the gas of the car that he was filling up um, lows. Um, and he... our our, uh, our 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 favorite fan uh, has a message for you on here. Uh, which which one though is it La Dolce Vita or Even and Tony? Because La Dolce Vita is also my favorite film of all time, and I could talk about it. No, that's your favorite film. Favorite film of all time. I thought you hated that film. 
There's, everybody does. It's so boring. You've honestly. only you've only sent me the MP4 of it <laughs> three times. I, I've been I've been trying to prep my girlfriend to watch it, and it's like it's like it's my favorite film of all time. Yeah, yeah, there we go, there we go. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm like like you know, it's super boring. Nothing happens, and it's three hours long. Like you're not gonna like it. She's um, not used to that by by now. We felt like you're. Uh, <laughs> It, I, I try. Anyway, I try to like balance I it. Yeah, the word, and I'm not putting on subtitles. So, um, but anyway, just to get back to the to the point that I'm trying to make really quick on this shot is that um, it the the scene that this happens in is a is a causation of birds, but also the ignorance of them around. The guy that lights the cigar is very like oh, whatever of the birds. A hundred percent. The guy doesn't even seem to know that 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 you know the guy only drops the cigar because he's so surprised by a bird attacking him. He ha it seems like he's just coming to town. He's not necessarily even aware that there is a bird attack. Yeah, um, and, and he's just like, oh, I'll take you. I'll show you guys the way out of here. Like, no big deal. Um, yeah. But but the interesting thing about this is that we're looking at a either the, people call it the eye of God or the bird eye shot of yeah. above the town. And, and it starts off with this. And then birds then envelop the frame. As yeah, if no, we, birds develop the literal bird shot. Like, no, exa exactly, and, and, and it shows that the birds are now like, okay, we've caused this chaos, now let's go in and uh, continue it. And they, it, after the shot, obviously, the birds have their most vicious attack on the town that makes it look more apocalyptic by the end of the film. Yeah, well, I so I would, I would argue that the scene before that kind of makes it look a lot more apocalyptic. And the thing that I think is uh, incredibly beautiful about Hitchcock's filmmaking um, towards the end of the film, because, you know, the, the vast majority of the film, you're not actually seeing, like, bird attacks, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of, the only thing leaving you in suspense in that case is the the, the promise that at some point a bird's going to attack people, which makes sense because who doesn't want to see a fucking bird attack people? But, like, you're going to, uh, you're watching a movie with the intention of being like, all right, like, when's there going to be a bird? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, after that one slight gull attack. And uh, I'd, I'd say the scene that I think is the mo most apocalyptic is the one that, um, that that Hitchcock does the most beautifully. And it's my favorite scene in the movie where she's sitting on the playground and for some reason hasn't fully acknowledged that there might be a, like a, a bunch of birds attacking. And she's smoking a cigarette and you see the birds landing behind her until the entire uh, jungle gym or, you know, like is, is enveloped just by crows. And it, it really just it is the scene that like you realize like these birds, not, not only are they like, you know, not only are they attacking, they are organized and they are they are sitting here waiting for a moment where they can attack. And she kind of slowly, which builds the suspense so much more, obviously, um, like kind of creeps away back into the school and they don't do anything, which, you know, when something when you're expecting something because the last like four scenes have all involved uh, bird attacks, like and you're expecting a bird attack and there is no bird attack. That is far more suspenseful, I think than if the birds had just attacked her at that moment. Like, you're like, oh, fuck, what's going to happen? But it mirrors the scene in the beginning um, when she's at the dock and she's playing a prank on him. And there's the exact same shot composition um, where it's her face and she's laughing and then the dock. And and then she's and then she turns around, she looks back, there's the dock. It's her, like, it, it does this, uh, like, one-two shot combination. And when she's on the playground running away, it does the exact same thing. But this time, it's no longer kind of like a, like a whimsical... Um, like, oh, look, like they're, you know, this is their relationship. She's kind of playing a prank on him. She's like, all of a sudden it's terrifying because there's a pretty fucking big chance that every bird on that jungle gym is going to go for her at once and doesn't. But like in that sense, like you don't know whether that's going to envelop her. And I think that that's the most successful. And they have the creepy wibbly wobbly da, 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 thing. Like the kids seeing that in like an incredibly like almost like fascist way all at once. You're, you're listening to every kid in the school kind of singing this this nursery rhyme and the nursery rhyme um like looking up the words today was about how like a, a scottish guy ended up beating his wife for not um like cleaning the house the right way so it's kind of like a it's a terror it's it's terrifying in that sense already and then you're watching her kind of like look back at these birds it's uneasy and you don't know what the birds are going to do what the guy in the in the scottish song kind of does to his wife envelop her beat the shit out of her destroy her um in, in that sense Watching and watching that scene today made me realize how close she could come to like actually being being the solely one attacked by the birds on the jungle gym. Yeah, if and we're talking about the, the one, scene, she's the only one out there. And an interesting uh, uh, corollary to that, I guess, is that um, you know the the one the lady 
that's like the the, the dumb ornithological Audubon science lady <laughs> kind of says at one point, oh, birds don't flock together. In this movie, the birds don't flock together. So her scientific point on that doesn't make any sense. Because in that movie, you see a gull attack. You see a sparrow attack. You see a crow attack. You don't see necessarily those birds all attacking all in one. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they don't mix, uh, which I guess goes to Gianni's uh, eugenics point almost. Like, you don't see those birds mixing together as a flock. You see waves of birds as as they do also by staying still, you see different waves of birds, which also makes it more terrifying because they're organized in that sense. They're not like like all the birds in the town aren't attacking you at once. Waves of different kinds of birds are attacking you. And you start to realize how many different types of birds there are. You start to realize like in that sense how many like small birds can get through your like you know what I mean? Like the, the hole in the ceiling or whatever that would have existed that or the hole in the uh the, the roof that would have existed maybe in like yeah, a different yeah. house. Like a, like a sparrow can get through that, but a gull maybe can't get through that. You know what I mean? Like, or, or gulls can just peck, like, I don't think gulls can actually peck through a door, but like, in that sense, like, you start wondering, like, if a bird, if a bird had murderous intention, I was just saying, you know what? I don't care about whether I live or die. I'm just going to keep pecking through this fucking door. Like, could a door withstand that? Could a window withstand that? How many different things in your house uh, couldn't withstand a beak just repeatedly drilling into it? Like, it starts to be terrifying for that reason too, because you start thinking about your own house and how many different places a bird could get into your house. So like it starts, it stops just being terrifying. Cause it's like, Oh wow. Like, you know, this, someone's getting pecked to death by birds. You start thinking like, what if a bird wanted to attack me, which isn't a logical thought. So suddenly Hitchcock has dragged you into his illogical, suspenseful horror world because you're sitting there thinking like, 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 well, all right. But like, what if this happened? How would I survive it? And you wouldn't. And it's like it's terrifying for that reason as well. <laughs> so two two really quick things. Um, one one is on the eugenics point. But before I even get to that, um, the um, the the scene where the the crows are all on the uh, jungle gym, and then they go inside and they get the kids to escape, and they all run. Um, again, going back to how inspired Hitchcock was of Russian filmmaking. If you compare that scene to the stair step scene in Battleship Latenkin, it is nearly, um, it is nearly shot not not shot for shot, but the the feeling is the same of everybody running away from this um, increasing danger that is only creeping closer to them. Um, it is it is incredible if you were to watch those scenes back to back how much they influence each other. And then really, oh, wait, quick- I have to I have to quickly make this joke. The I I just think you know pecking her to death six times was too many, and you know I would have you know even pecking her to death two times is too many. <laughs> I'm sorry, go on. it's all right. Uh, but then back to the eugenics point, it, it's even flirted in the beginning of the film, and even and even in a way becomes a main um, I wouldn't say a main theme, but a central occurrence in the film is in the beginning of the movie. They talk uh, when she's acting like she's a um, works for the bird shop, or the, uh, the pet store. Um, she says like, "Oh well, you know, we have to keep these birds in cages. Other otherwise, they would get out and cause all these problems, especially yeah, in the molting easy. season." Right, right. Especially, you know, so they essentially don't want these birds to breed and mix, which goes back to that whole eugenics claim. Um, but then also goes back to the whole. Um, people end up staying inside, locked inside their houses kind of thing that ends up happening at the end of the film. Essentially, the birds make the humans retreat to their cages in a way. Well, John said, you know, eating crow is a phrase. I mean, birds of feather flock together. Like, you know, but in that sense, like waves of birds are terrifying because there's like so many different kinds of birds. Like, let's say that they don't, like, I I think it kind of would have been more absurd if a whole bunch of birds altogether had fucking attacked someone because you couldn't f- really figure out which birds were attacking the fact that at one point it's seagulls which are already kind of terrifying i've been pecked by a seagull like you know earlier today actually and i didn't <laughs> no but like no when i was a kid like living in maine and you would be eating like chips on the beach and you wouldn't move very much the seagull would just try to come take the chip out of your hand like you know what i mean like seagulls are, are kind of fearless in that sense and you know i mean songbirds and sparrows are obviously the ones least likely to attack you um, uh, I'm in that sense, but kind of Hitchcock's playing on the fact that crows are the most intelligent bird. So when she's like, well, crows don't have the brain pattern. No, they fucking do. If a crow, if a bunch of crows, like, which is obviously a murder of crows, like the actual term for it, 
Like, you know, if a bunch of crows wanted to attack you, they can solve complex problems. Like, that is a terrifying, and, you know, that's not something that they didn't know back then either. You know, like, uh, like they've been doing experiments on crows for a really long time. Thinking like, oh, well, a crow and a, like, like, yeah, she knows the difference between like a, like a crow and like a blackbird or whatever. But like the woman doesn't know that, that like a crow is incredibly intelligent and, a, and like a blackbird is not. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was ravens. Not that it makes a difference at all. No, I thought it was. I, 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 I double checked it. All right. All right I didn't so want right. to bring up that point. And so right. ravens, <laughs> no, 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 oh, you're fine. But um, the only other thing I have to contribute also isn't really relevant. But every time you say that the birds are organized, I think of that movie Chicken Run and it makes me laugh. So. Oh, it makes me think of Karthik earlier making the point about <laughs> solidarity with the birds. Which <laughs> I think in some sense you are supposed to feel like e even that trailer. You're supposed to feel some sense of solidarity with the birds as a cage and oppressed class, um, you know, in the way that Karthik wanted to bring it up at the beginning, a, a, a class that, you know, that that is is getting organized and it's like it's terrifying because we're obviously humans and they're birds and you would be the on the receiving end of that but then watching even the trailer and realizing how many different fucked up things we do to birds uh <laughs> yeah karthik i i kind of wanted to ask like uh, how you feel any kind of solidarity with the characters in the first place i i uh, all of the terrifying and of the birds like i watched it almost like it was a comedy like the i was on the side of the birds and I felt none of the uh, the the the. I mean, I'm I'm calling it. Uh, it's it's difficult to even call them humans because it's like it's just elite bourgeois society. And I feel zero of the kind of uh, you know the the struggles that they faced by, because they couldn't deal with the birds. Like all the three things that you pointed out, um, that is just like elite bourgeois society bourgeois figuring out figuring out how to deal bourgeois. with a, a problem of like property damage and things like that. That's basically all that's happening. It's just like holy shit, these people are rioting. These birds are like you know lighting things on fire. What do we do with them? How do we contain them? That's the kind of like kind of um impression that i get out of the uh, of the society that the birds are attacking so i kind of and, and since you point out the blue eyes and like the fascist kind of singing and all of that um zero empathy i kind of feel like um i was entirely on the side of the birds and uh, it almost like no tension in the movie other than the fact that like the attacks couldn't start quicker so i was just like um, the only, the only tension whole... in the movie besides the birds will they won't they and you don't know. You don't know, folks. You don't know where they're going to fuck. And, and the thing is that, like, you know, the, 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 the sort of scene where they, um, e like, even introduce the problem and talk about it uh, inside the room for the first time um, after the, the, the birds break in through the chimney, I'm, I forget exactly the nature of the exchange, but it's just, like, entirely about, like, you know, they damage the property yeah. Um, it's kind of like uh, the 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 utensils that were hanging, the the china that was hanging <laughs> on the mantelpiece. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Well, well, if I no, could just... more the mother probably, not the not the woman. She's like unassuming. It's more the mother who probably deserves it in Psycho. Well, like because that's the subversion. That's the anti-authority, anti-authoritarian act. Like after that, like in if anything the. The character kind of assumes the position of the mater maternal authority, and like even the same thing happens in Joker. Like it's just the the character kind of assumes uh, the position of like the the nagging uh, mom, and then like you know um, does the inflicts the violence off that that he endured to the external person. Like so, the, well, the humans, same thing. Humans in, I mean, in Hitchcock films, a lot of times humans are kind of just archetypes, right? Like you kind of expect a certain pattern from them. They fit into these tropes. They fit into certain archetypes. And the usual Hitchcock subversion is that they, they break away from it. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, um, Norman Bates being a mama's boy in, in, in psycho, the breakaway from it is that he's murdered his mom and he's like, he has become her as his alternate personality. The, the, the trope though, is that as a mama's boy, he's like, Oh, well I love my, like my mom's just, you know, I'm taking care of her. Hitchcock, breaks away from that trope by completely subverting it in in this movie the, i think the thing the reason that you feel like the characters are one-dimensional and you don't connect with them is because the only thing that actually is being subverted is the birds like the birds attacking people is a subversion of their normal psychological behavior you think throughout the movie that other characters are going to have that they don't other characters are literally just these tropes like i mean i mean the diner scene is obviously the biggest uh representation of that 
when it's just literally tropes that have been repeated now. Like, it's weird to watch these movies on the other side of it because I think, uh, you know, there's been, which is why also I think people feel like Hitchcock movies a lot of times are cornier than they probably were at the time is because pretty much every movie has taken, like, Hitchcockian tropes. But he's kind of creating, like, these archetypes. You're waiting for him to subvert one of them. He doesn't. The only thing that really is subverted in, in this movie is the fact that you think birds are fine and they're murderous. Like, that's the only thing that really in this movie gets subverted. So, like, there's these, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a not to be too Jordan Peterson about it, I guess, but, like, the consuming mother. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, and you think that she's going to consume him. Uh, she doesn't. She's just literally afraid of being abandoned. She, she wants whatever, you know, she wants to kind of be assured that he's not going to go away. You know, there's all these relationships that seem internally damaging, and they seem like they're going to play into these dynamics that we've seen a million times, and they don't play into those dynamics. They're just kind of flawed. Flawed maybe is the wrong word. Psychologically, uh, psychologically archetypical people that kind of um, don't behave. Like, they kind of, things are just normal. Like, it's a, I mean, it's a fucked up family. It's a fucked up family. The dad died. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a family that's been through some trauma. She's been probably through some trauma too, I'd assume. But like those, you, they never quite, the character development isn't there. So you're like, oh, I don't really feel for, what you feel for is the fact that the character development happens because of like the, the birds have character development, which is kind of an insane thing. This, this to me is like basically the reason why I feel like it's more like a post-colonial reading is deserved because like um, the, the, oh, the, 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 no, the humanization of reading. the birds is like, sorry? No, there's de- there's a hundred percent like a post colonial reading of the birds, like like uh, the the, hum- the humanization of the birds is kind of like uh it's it's not they're no longer uh, you know subhuman and they're kind of like claiming their rightful place uh, in history etc. Uh, but also on the other hand, like uh, I since we talked about this and I, I feel like we didn't even uh, engage at the like come at the topic from this angle. Uh, so I wanted to ask. Um, since we did so much of nuclear and Cold War type stuff in the previous um, like the shows that I've been on, I wanted to ask really? like what you thought of the idea of the, the birds mm-hmm. as like a nuclear uh, testing, like sorry, uh, but the birds as nuclear testing um, in an on an island um, where like you know like these plastic uh, dummy figurines of people uh, are existence and uh, are existing, and then the birds are just basically um, the the, the whatever like the specter of uh, nuclear tests being you know conducted on their own people etc so I, wonder what like a... I wish i had clipped this because the, I, there was a thing that i watched earlier where um hitchcock was talking about in 1944 a year before we dropped the atom bomb to end the war he had predicted kind of like the atomic uh like the, the atomic situation i guess and there's a clip with him another one of those dick cavett episodes where he's talking about how in, in his mind he had predicted uh uranium as a <laughs> as a source of, of nuclear technology. So I, I wish I had clipped that for this, for that answer. <laughs> Your um, Well, two, two things. Um, and I know we're past the two hour mark, but, um, yeah, I wanted to go through a couple more aesthetic things before we signed off. So at the end of this part of it, I wanted to go through it with you, especially because, I uh, I took a couple two shots and I wanted to get your opinion on them specifically, honestly. But you, you know, I'll talk movies all day, so I have no I have no problem, especially if you want to talk aesthetics. But um, just two things. So it, I think it's interesting um, that you make the kind of Godzilla sort of um, comparison with the birds, as if like you know we've been we've disturbed nature enough with our own man made catastrophes, so the catastrophe comes to us through nature. But to go back to the mother point, because it's funny after watching uh, Planet of the Apes this week, because that was the exact point made by Planet of the Apes. You know what's crazy is I just got the Godzilla Criterion Collection, like that that big release thing that they had. Um, and I, so I've been watching Godzilla films, and I've been can like, you, "Can you lend that to me?" When I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> just, for like, just for a couple weeks. Maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, it, 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 I, um, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Anyway, uh, so my movie collection is like right here. Um, I, it's just one of my favorite things in the world. But so just quick, out of screen. Yeah, just out of just out of here. I could just out I could, of screen. I can rotate it a little bit. All right. You know, I show the you. show the beauty of it all. Um, but anyway, um, something I really wanted to touch on, and again, one reason why I keep taking this film um, into more of a feminist lens is because I feel like the mother, if you look at like other interpretations of this film, she really gets blamed a lot. For the reason why the birds attack 
Um, and to me, the mother is such a misunderstood character, which again is so much of what happens with um, these, uh, or so much of what happened with um, women and uh, feminism at the time, where they would catch the blame for so many of the problems when really they are their vic they are victims of the society that has made them be the type of people that wake up every day and want to make breakfast for their husband that died years ago. Yeah. This is the mother she, goes she, through. She lo like, loneliness is what's driving her. Absolutely. Like, and, the, and, and I think that, that you're really, you're not in conversation with the film itself. You're in conversation with Hitchcock when uh, they're having the conversation. And she says, oh, like, you know, so the obsessive controlling mother. And she's like, no, I don't think that's what that is. You're yes, kind of yes, the school teacher you're talking about, the conversation yeah, with yeah. the school teacher. When, when yeah, yeah. Like you're yeah. Kind of, I mean, you know, it starts off very passive aggressive. And, and it turns into this kind of very open uh, dialogue. And I think you're really, who you're talking to is Hitchcock in that sense, because you're talking to Hitchcock who has spent his life kind of making these movies a lot of times, especially Psycho, the one right before this, where it's obviously, you know, uh, incredibly flawed. Um, and I think he kind of have, had a flawed relationship with his mother too, because I, I want to play this clip at the end, but there's a clip that I have where he uh, makes this strange joke on uh, Dick Cavett that I think is 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 kind of funny about how his mother scared him. And that's why he's like, I don't know. It's a very, it's an interesting moment, but I, I think that you're really in dialogue with Hitchcock himself when um, she's like, Oh, well it must be like an obsessive and like controlling mother. And she's like, no, it's a mother with fear of abandonment. Like her husband died and her, and she, you know, she has a young daughter and she's afraid of being abandoned. And, you know, it, it makes her act in ways that she doesn't necessarily want to, which is different than when you're maybe watching a, another, uh, another Hitchcock film where the mother is controlling by definition and wants to control her, her son's life. I don't think this mother really is and gets the run of the blame for that fact, but also is someone dealing with psychological issues. And I think Hitchcock is kind of fucking with the audience by being in dialogue with the audience, being like, listen, I'm not doing that in this movie. Like, this is something that I'm moving away from, from this movie. And like, like you have to deal with that. Like it, it's expected. And that's the suspense. It's expected that, that this woman is going to control her son's life. And that's not what's going on. And you literally sense that in dialogue. I and think. Really quick. And I mean, like, seriously, one sentence, like he very specifically says in that scene, like all due respect to Oedipus, I don't think that's what it is. Yeah. And that is such a, a blatant, like point to literary analysis of like, Oh, we have this trope of like the mother son dynamic. No, this isn't what it is. It's she's a scared of being abandoned. She's scared of her post being uprooted because that's all she knows. Which obviously the most edible really movie uh, ever cre created is Psycho right before that. So I, I didn't think about all this stuff until today really. But like, you know, the third time I was watching through it, I was thinking like, all right, like he's kind of, cause I'd watched interviews with him right before, like right before this movie came out. And it was like, you know, he's talking about how like he doesn't want to necessarily be uh, pigeonholed into this. That movie had found obviously incredible success, um, which, all of his movies did, but like, you know, yeah, no, literally as J.H. says, he's re reacting against Psycho. Like he's reacting, like he's, he's, he's a creative, well, he's not a toy. He's, he's reacting to the thing that he's created and he's in conversation with the last movie he did, which is, you know, one of the most, honestly, like to this day, most successful movies of all time, as is a lot of Hitchcock stuff. But Hitchcock, I think was reacting to himself kind of becoming this, uh, you know, this trope, this very, incredibly predictable um auteur that that kind of everyone's like oh well i'm the, i know what to expect in a hitchcock film this movie kind of breaks all of those uh hitchcockian rules so i wanted to i mean as as like a as a quick i guess last thing i wanted to look through some of these uh these shots this is a, a two shot that he did um when she discovers like the guy that had sold her the chickens uh had his eyes pretty much pecked out so this is the first um this is the first. So this is her walking into. Hey, the they look more gouged out, but hey, that's just me. <laughs> this is this is her walking into the room, and then. Donna, Donna, Donna. Direction. Yeah. So then you just yeah. see his feet, which builds the suspense of it, and then you see her. I feel like Bray doing this, by the way, Gianni. I feel like I'm Greg Bray. It's this. So there's this, and then going further into it. So it's like this two shot that exists her like in the same way that kind of when uh when 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 Tippy Henry is running and then it kind of jumps from her to the thing like it, in the kind of the same way Hitchcock is building up the suspense by uh by showing you what she's seeing 
and then what like what actually exists and then what she's seeing again so i don't know i think it's honestly a a pretty uh incredible representation of what hitchcock was trying to do with this also well, terrifying because you know throughout this movie it hasn't really been violent to that level and then you see a dude with his eyes fucking pecked out well two two things on this um one uh, both are aesthetically but the first one is the brutality that Hitchcock is adding to the bird's qualities in the, these frames alone. Because this, to me, shows that it's not just some like random birds are attacking. Birds are taking some sort of revenge, have some sort of plot. Because they not only killed this man enough to knock him out of his bed at night, but then plucked his eyes out. You know, which also comes with religious symbolism. If you talk about like Jesus getting uh, uh, on the cross with the two criminals um, and the you, one criminal. I purposely baptized you, but you don't have to bring him into everything. <laughs> well, no, well, I mean, but it's significant Personally. enough. You, you know, it's significant <laughs> enough. It's, Oedipus it's, was blinded. Oedipus uh, became blind at the because uh, he, he had sex with his mother. So, well, yeah. but, but, but quite literally in the Bible, the, the one criminal who did not repent for his sins at the end of his life his eyes were plucked out by crows. So, I mean, I, I think that it is, it is so much like Hitchcock is showing you right there the brutality of these birds and that their intent is to cause pain, not just some random, we're going after humans because of whatever. Yeah. Um, the other thing here aesthetically, and it, I talked about it a little bit earlier, was just this is, the, this is Hitchcock playing with editing and the ways... Uh, Russian editing um, ha uh, played with the human psyche. When you go through trauma, it's not all at once. It's not um, you, the, everything slows down and you say some words and you put things together. It's very boom, boom, boom. It's very like, oh, you realize this is what's happening. You see this is what happened. You come to gr you come to reality and realize that the rest of your life or the rest of um, whatever the situation is, is not going to be the same because of what happened. And, and, your, when, and your own humanity reacts in the same way that she seems to react when, um, you know, I mean, when, when she's attacked, like your first impulse when it comes to uh, trauma is to fight through it. Like you're not thinking about your own mental state in that sense. So like the same way that she was kind of fighting the birds until she couldn't anymore, um, you know, you wake up later and you're still kind of metaphorically fighting the birds, but that's not your full, for your first impulse. And, and it's very clear, you know, this is after the scenes where they figured out it wasn't just random. It's after three times. And there's clearly something wrong with the birds, that this is very deliberately really the birds are wrong coming to revenge. With the birds. They're hitting the windmills. You ever seen a windmill? <laughs> um, I can't see a windmill now without thinking of the Trump. Uh, windmills are very bad for birds. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to, so I wanted to bring this in as the last kind of uh, thing that we talk about, which is you know, um, this headline is sensational as fuck, which it should be, but like it's kind of funny, you know, on the other side of it. Um, seabird invasion hits coastal homes, which is the story that this is based on. And at the time, uh, there was no there was no explanation for why that had happened, which kind of is what obviously Hitchcock is playing on. Um, because he had, he had called the newspaper, I guess. He lived near Santa Cruz where this had happened. And it's referenced in the movie that, you know, this had happened before in Santa Cruz. So you're kind of imagining what would happen if this happened in a town, like, near Santa Cruz, but not there. You know what I mean? So, and two years later, I guess, technically. So he's, like, envisioning a, another bird attack after this bird attack has already happened. And they're like, oh, wait, this happened in a town nearby, like, not too long ago. But there was no answer for it at the time. Um, there, I guess there is now. And, uh, you know, the answer is, is honestly pretty fucking incredible. Not anything that I would have expected. Um, there, a, a toxin producing algae, I guess, had, um, like, I guess like seagulls, there were, there, there's a weird, uh, name for them in this, the specific kind of bird. It's like, a um, I guess, hold on. I think it's like a shandy or something like that. Um, but you know, so this, this, they had eaten this, uh, they'd eaten this, um, algae and it was like an algae that usually infects crabs uh, not that kind of crabs get your fucking mind out of the gutter Gianni G Jesus fucking Christ 
<laughs> but uh, no. So yeah. So it was like a, it, it, hey, I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> hey, crabs. <laughs> um. So yeah, which I I really hate that this is the name for it, but it's pseudo Nietzschea. Um, spelled a lot like Nietzsche, which it's just too on the nose. But like, this is the actual story of what happened. It's literally spelled kind of like, I mean, it doesn't have the E, but it's like Nietzsche. Like, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so they, they managed in 2012 to test the water and, and discover that the water they had taken the samples at the time contained a, a, a toxin, which had infected these birds' minds. And I guess in the real story of it, the birds were like throwing up. On, like, so they, they had not only attacked, they not only landed on people and like freaked out and they were kind of just freaking out, pecking stuff, but also they were throwing up, regurgitating. The thing in every single quote is regurgitating anchovies, which is fucking disgusting because that was the first time I ever remember throwing up those anchovies. So, you know, right in the fields. But um, uh, so they had taken samples, and in 2012 they discovered that the thing that Hitchcock's birds, in a sense, were infected with was this uh this toxin that had kind of not only poisoned them, but I guess you know as it buries into your brain had caused them to be incredibly aggressive and just you know because obviously birds don't know what the fuck is going on with that happens as humans probably wouldn't if we were all infected with some weird toxin and they start freaking out and as the birds freaked out they had done things like peck their way through and like like similar stuff to what had happened in the birds honestly um so it's interesting that at the time though you know for for decades after that nobody knew what the fuck uh you know what was going on and that's because, you know, the cops seemed too cavalier about uh, coastal invasion because Biden hadn't passed the 1994 crime bill yet, which <laughs> which gave them overriding powers to, you know, just militarize. So I don't think it's too cavalier. <laughs> I blame Joe Biden. But yeah. Biden, uh, birds, they both start with a B. So, you yeah. Know. Well, you're blaming Mr. Burns? Oh, birds. <laughs> Biden, Mr. Burns. <laughs> no, I, I I, have a theory that, you know, all all bad policy choices over the last, I guess, 50 years, because he was elected in uh, 1973, so it's close to 50 years. All bad policy in the last 40 years somehow, um, uh, you know, I, th- I think Biden has an incredibly bipolar streak where, you know, uh, there are times he so he opposed the Vietnam War um, as like a, a more state uh, as as a state uh, senator and then had been elected fully and it still opposed he kind of suffered from Vietnam syndrome and then in the nineties became like one of the most reactionary um, one of the most reactionary foreign policy people available which is why he got the reputation because the more reactionary you are as a foreign policy um, politician the more they assume you know about the world. The more you tend to support war. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I was gonna say that's a that's a fun sentiment because uh, Alexander Coburn was talking about, and I don't remember the policy it was, but there's some policy that Biden helped push through that made it easier for people to become bankrupt uh, for credit cards or something like that. I don't I don't quite remember what it was. Oh no no no! It was the student loan crisis caused by Biden because right. Of- Biden right. was uh, Biden. Delaware is known as a as a tax haven, right. so you know um, Biden was like the credit card senator, right? Uh, and senator, so like, yeah, and so Alexander Coburn was uh, saying, I forget which interview it was in, but he was like, yeah, what everybody should do is take their credit card bills, put it on a truck, and send it to Joe Biden's house so he can pay for it. I feel so. like every I feel like every leftist has like Alexander Coburn and and then Hitchens like on either side of it, and it's like you know. It's some of this either like like resisting it to the point of like you know becoming sickly resisting uh American imperialism and then Hitchens being like a, a fucking neocon. Yeah, I, yeah, right. And it, it's all it's always weird because uh, when when Hitchens was uh, being all pro Iraq War at the same time he's like, yeah, listen, I don't trust anything the CIA says. And it's like, well, <laughs> we we are in Iraq because of the information they supposedly gave us. So weapons of mass destruction, right? And it's, so it's, it's a big it's, problem. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We can, yeah, I, right, but so I, my, my, you know, working working with Ben as long as I did, he's writing like the the Hitchens book, like uh, the big Hitchens thing. I think for me, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is like new atheist brain. So 
the problem that I think that Hitchens had wasn't that he trusted any institution. It was that, you know, after the Twin Towers had gotten hit and like it, he kind of talked about this at length in, in, in different like Hitchens had gone from kind of being a somewhat Marxist, like, you know, like a, like a Trotskyist leftist uh, author that was kind of a dissident to being like, oh, well, religion is to blame. So, yes. you know, I mean, and, and this kind of ties into the birds, too, because it's like when when re- when religion obviously fails in that sense, not that Hitchens was, was ever religious, he was always an atheist. But when it's seen that the, the main cause of something, as it is in, uh, uh, I guess, uh, like the, the State Department version of jihad, like, you know what I mean? Like taking the geopolitics and taking the, the different sectarian um, problems out of, of the conflict and just saying, listen, there are Muslims that are trying to bomb, uh, 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 like, you know what I mean? Like, so just making it into a religious conflict is right. incredibly simple. And in that mind, like, oh, well, Muslims now want to bomb, you know, the U.S. Right. So it, what happens? It, it, yeah. it, it, it's fun that you say new atheist brain because, and I am evoking Gore Vidal once again. But <laughs> Hitchens wrote that article on, on Gore Vidal, um, Vidal Loco, which is a horrible title for essay anyway but he was talking about how um oh why would such why would a talent such as uh vidal spend his time around you know in the gutters of paranoid people and uh conspiracy theorists and it's like well you know it's like hitchens you 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 ended up in the gutter there too so you're you're not you just ended up in worse than the fucking gutter yeah like a like neo like a neoconservatism like I mean, I guess I'm looking at it. Well, no, I mean, you know, we've lived through like having the first kind of real neocon president, like in, in Bush, like, it, like right. you know, what I mean, like a, a fully neocon administration, which I don't think Bush ever was. Like his dad was the head of the CIA, but lots of people in his administration are obviously neocons, which is why they're coming back to the Democratic Party now. Um, like it's kind of I- insane in the way that like that was never going to be a good idea. Like neoconservatism was never going to be a fucking good idea in the same way that like as much as, you know, I mean, I enjoyed interviewing him like the, the whole Glenn Greenwald like reactionary thing isn't going to be a good idea. Yes. So, those things are not going to age well because like, I don't know, like we kind of progress like society doesn't revert back to that kind of reactionary globalist policy, which, right. is, you know, is fine. But like it, that's not where, where the world is heading. You can tell that it's not where the world is heading. And to have, you know, a fully uh, neocon administration and to have someone like Kitchens just fully buy into that makes sense only in the context of suddenly realizing religion is bad, which I think that a lot of uh, a lot of new atheists have new atheist brain. Like Sam Harris is a perfect example, someone that the only way that you can understand why they have such a reactionary and racist uh, foreign policy suggestion is because the only way that they can uh, uh, understand our, our turn towards terrorism and the Middle East as, as a, a site of conflict. The only way they can understand that is, oh, well, religion is bad and we need to get rid of religion. And right. like, but then it's like, all right, I agree with that in the sense of like, I'm an atheist. Like, I don't think that religion is, I think religion has been an over, I think there are times religion has been positive, but I think overwhelmingly religion has been used as a negative wedge to like, you know, to, to drive for the last, I mean, like thousand years, right. some of the most reactionary policies and, and some of the most regressive policies. But saying, you know, saying, oh, well, the, the way that we deal with that is by like bombing people in different countries with certain religions is the most, you know, it's not going to happen. They're ideas. They're ideas that someone has in their head. So, you're not, you're not gonna... <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say, so I, I mess with a, a lot of atheists I know because I'm an atheist who really doesn't care for a lot of atheists because they yeah, are that's, no, new that's atheists. Yeah, 100% what I am. And I, I mess with them and I call them godless Christians. They're the people who like to go out there and say, I can be a good Christian with all these Christian virtues, but I don't need God. You know, yeah. they're the they're the people, you know, they they um you know they haven't pass- escaped they haven't escaped from a yes. uh, a, a Christian framework. Yeah, which they, is they, how I feel about New Atheism itself is kind of a cult and a religion. Like yes, it's the religion they, of atheism. They're they're the people who pack their knapsack with ketchup and ice cream and tell their parents that they don't need them and so it, it's it's a it's an interesting thing that they would resort to the military because in a sense first off like i don't believe i i'm an atheist too i don't think the metaphysical claims the truth that christianity has are are true i think they're false and um i would probably call myself uh agnostic more than i would say yeah. atheist in the sense of i don't really believe that there's absolutes but yeah no i no, I, 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 I have a uh I have a, I have a problem with having 
opinionated opinions. And so I would say I'm yeah. an atheist. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sold on that, but uh, I do understand Christianity in the sense of a cultural phenomenon. Um, and I think when you look at their, them resorting to the military, it's similar to when the Christians resorted to the crusades where they ran into quite, uh, quite, yeah. uh, quite, um, I guess in the Bush administration, at least quite um, uh, overtly like, yes, right. It, it was, it was a holy war. And for us, the difference is, is our notion of what's sacred and what's holy is now it's, it's in secular garb. It's uh it's patriotism. It used to be, if you were a good patriot, it's because you're a good Christian. Now it's more, if you know, um, it it's, has less of a, a religious root, although it's not entirely gone. Um, but being a good patriot is, you know, what everybody refers to. You know, the, the people with Trump, they're like, "Oh, we're good patriots," and it's like, yeah. And that's why we uh, that's why we had to rush into the White House. And yes, over- right, over- right. At over election, right. <laughs> so as patriots, that we don't think that our opinion. Can't like our opinion can't uh can't be can't be disproved by democracy. Right, right ex- exactly, and you know, <laughs> and since 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 all that uh, democracy jazz, as it was brought up in the movie, <laughs> uh, you know, I I. I, I hope democracy jazz is not as bad as a uh, actual jazz. I'm I'm, cha- I'm channeling my inner Adorno here. How the but, fuck are you? How the fuck are you like as to to postmodernism as you are, and yet don't like jazz? I. I feel well, like I, 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 I'm most, I'm mostly joking because I'm I'm pretty sure that Seth is watching this and he and I will have words later. Um, but I, uh, never the, yeah. so I was I was so I had a family that had a um a house in East Hampton where Jackson Pollock hit the tree. So I passed uh, I I passed by there and I was like, oh, Jackson Pollock's last uh, splatter painting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if 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 he I was... mean, I, I feel like, but I feel like there's the the connection of jazz kind of being like a, a, a musical version of, of that kind of um, almost absurdist uh, artistic expression. Yeah. Um, I, I have Funded a lot by of the CIA as yeah, was, I, as was jazz. I, I have a lot of uh, weird. Uh, well, I guess we should not say weird uh, nuanced opinions because I'm an existentialist who hates absurdist. Every time somebody brings up Camus, you know, I reach for my gun as the saying goes. Um, I hate it. Because Camus is, it, it, he didn't mean it this way, but he's used in a very reactionary manner to, to maintain things as they are. You're supposed to imagine you're happy rather than go do it. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. well, the, the thing about the thing about kind of a, a, a like almost absurdist level of um, abstraction in art and in culture in general is during the Cold War it had taken off because kind of we were trying to prove to the USSR. That like, oh, look at all the cool things you could do in America. And part of that was CIA, fun- which if you really, like, I've been on the CIA binge so much. Like, I've been on a CIA, they, they recruited me. No, I've been on a CIA, like, so I've been reading so much, like, so many books on, on you know, how the CIA kind of uh, had, had gotten into all of these different covert, um, you know, expressions of their thing. Like, including the last book that I read, kind of, I feel like they get more and more specific. So it's like, oh, like, the CIA, like you know, had killed, like, killed obviously a lot of, um, you know, world leaders, which is obviously something that, you know, has been confirmed over and over again. Um, but then it's like, oh, the CIA probably killed JFK, which is something that, you know, is, is worth exploring, I think. But then, so I, the last book I read is uh, JFK versus Alan Dulles, Indonesia, which is very specifically um, the CIA killed JFK because of his Indonesian policy, which I think is an interesting thesis. I don't necessarily think that that's the right thesis, but like, I really, I, like the 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 proof that they had given is um right you know, I, yeah <laughs> right well um again one more time <laughs> one more time evoking the name of the dead Gore Vidal he was he was he had some part in the Kennedy administration not as a, an administrator but just somebody who came to the White House and partied I'm never and, gonna live down during Walker saying uh, with all due respect to Kissinger <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but uh, Vidal believed that it was the mafia who uh, uh, killed Kennedy, and I don't know how that theory holds because uh, I, I I actually don't know. I don't have an opinion. Uh, but he thinks he thinks that the mafia killed him because they used mafia connections to make sure that uh, 
they won certain states, certain areas, and then uh, well, Bob- um, I mean, the, the thing about the mafia in connection to Kennedy is that, um, and this is proven uh, during their response to Castro and Cuba, um, they had recruited people in the mafia to try to assassinate Castro. Which makes sense because, you know, Batista was incredibly mafia connected. The mafia was using Cuba at that point to kind of create like a very um, Las Vegas situation. But, you know, but even even more so because there's like, you know, the laws, if if someone's in charge of a country, like the laws are going to be incredibly favorable. Whoever's giving them a lot of money, which is where Godfather 2, which I my favorite fucking Godfather movie, honestly, Um, you know, is kind of playing with that throughout it. I mean, Coppola is a fucking genius. But you know the, the connections that the mafia Hell had with, yes. uh, with the with the Batista uh, regime, and you know a very like it is proven that they did reach out. Like you know the testimony from the actual people they reached out to um, later during the church committee, uh, the, the 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 mafia was recruited in order to assassinate Castro. At yeah, o- Operation Mongoose. Yeah. So the the theory is that those people were still kind of on their payroll, which they were. And that, the, you know, the mafia had been recruited to kill uh, Kennedy. I don't necessarily believe that part of it. Right. Um, but but that is kind of the, that's where the mafia connection comes Well, from. yeah, v- v- Vidal said that he thought that um, Kennedy's father was trying to play two sides where he was using the mafia, but then he let Bobby Kennedy go after organized crime. Yeah. And his, his only excuse to uh, Gia Connie uh, I think is who he was talking to was he said, well, my sons are dragon slayers. And so Gia Connie's like, eh, it's, it's whatever. Well, Kennedy's, <laughs> Kennedy's father had um, also kind of, you know, he, he was, he was the head of the fucking, uh, yep. under, under Roosevelt. He was the one that was watching like the stock exchange. So like, you know, it, it's not necessarily, you know, Kennedy had, had uh, like the Sinatra connections to the mafia, which is true, but uh, you know, Oh yeah, right. Yeah. No, Jay and, was killing it with these comments because he's. I mean, number one, he's the only one commenting anyway. But uh, this is, you know, nice place you got here, Castro. Doesn't Castro have a nice place here? Been it's gonna be a shame if something happens. All the <laughs> uh, I don't know. Final thoughts, I guess. Yeah, um, being my first uh, Hitchcock movie in my lifetime, although I have heard of him, I have to say I have a pretty good positive review so i would say like maybe a nine out of ten maybe nine and a half out of ten um i really kind of wish there was more like as i was kind of getting into the movie i was like i'm just pretty sure there's going to be a bird attack a bird attack a bird attack uh because like even there were some scenes like when she's actually giving the the lovebirds to uh mr daniels i think is what his name uh or Mr. Bennett, rather. Uh, I'm thinking when, as he's looking through his binoculars, as she's getting attacked by the uh, by the by the gull in the forehead. I'm I thought thinking, the CIA had gotten you, by the way. Uh, I thought the CIA had taken you out. Oh, what? No. I'm glad, I'm glad you're okay. Yeah, you know. Um, no, just uh, had to uh, stop my cats from knocking over something. Yeah, CIA cat cat uh intelligence <laughs> yeah yeah cat drones I, I can't believe in birds or cats now so yeah basically i was saying like i was just so hoping as he was looking through his binoculars he was going to see another swarm of birds and it just didn't really happen i was thinking being a horror movie you kind of like you see a lot of that stuff happening and well, that's, also that's, also typical that's, uh, no that's movies. that's 21st century brain getting to you because um you know or you know even even late late because this isn't necessarily considered like late uh 20th century filmmaking like you know the 60s is its own um thing it's right after like the new new cinema started uh like you know um new hollywood wasn't making uh sequels so they we weren't making Gilbert, sequels yeah. in mind which when we were watching planet of the apes uh, was really the first planet of the apes was the first movie that they had kind of in 1968 kind of turned okay. into like a franchise so this I was, was gonna like, ask pre, yeah so this was pre uh franchise if you made if you made a movie they weren't necessarily thinking about like how can we continue to monetize this um it was it was like you know like this movie is a is a solo work of uh the only the only thing that they were really making sequels of is like b movies where they could do it for you know for like nothing. the so like the last one i was gonna make uh, about like a horror movie uh typical like you leave kind of an open ending like we don't know what happened to melanie when did they go to the hospital? Did she survive? Did she not? Because she was basically, um, 
she was uh, traumatized by the the birds attacking her in the attic. And I think and, this uh, is one of the this is one of the few movies that they could. This is one of the first movies they could have left an open ending hmm. because you know the Hayes Code had only been abolished uh, three years before that. So uh, you know under the Hayes Code you couldn't lo- like leave an open ending. The the ending would have been evil is punished and under under like penalty of like your your film being defunded the only ending you really could have was evil is punished in this sense in this movie they're you know evil is is whatever the fuck you uh transcribe on it like Mm. evil doesn't necessarily exist in the sense of like you know they're good and this is evil evil in the sense is you know human beings are being traumatized by something which is the same thing kind of in something like world of worlds where birds are the the cure for the for the evil, we aren't necessarily given like a, a good you know a good understanding of why aliens have chosen to uh, you know swarm us. We, you're not really given a you know you're not really given an explanation of why that is, but you know how it ends and you know why it's been stopped. In this, right. you don't know how it ends and you don't know if it's been stopped. So it's kind of right. the open ending that you know uh, something. And that, that was kind of like my obsession, that. though. It's like. How is this going to end? Like, as I was watching the movie, I was like, God, I really want to see what happens, you know? <laughs> and, like, the other thing I found out, like, Hitchcock did not want to put a V end uh, on the on the end of the picture. I didn't actually, I just learned that today as I was, ra- as I was finishing the movie. He, he, uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, he, he did, basically, after studio intervention said, hey, you need to put a V end to make it, like, a final... But what movie now has at the end? No movie has at the end. No, like, that's, that's like kind the, of a, it's a conceptual thing that existed in early cinema, like to tell the audience that the movie was over because you know, like you had to understand that. And I think that goes honestly back to the same Hayes Code thing. Like it, it had to be a morality tale. This is not a morality tale. This is a um, an, an open ended whatever the fuck you want to uh, transcribe onto a tale, and you kind of mm-hmm. have to. And there's a straightforward reading. The straightforward reading is. Birds are upset that we fucking killed them. And you saw that in the trailer. You know what I mean? And that's why the trailer and Hitchcock's trailers in general are so amazing is because he kind of gives you this weird, like, a, a very straightforward read, like, oh, like, look, there's birds on hats, there's birds here. But you watch the movie, that's not necessary. I mean, that is that is an interpretation, but, like, there's a bunch of other interpretations you can take from it, I think. Again, a nature, this is another thing of when nature attacks back. Yeah, I mean, we're eating, I think most, we're eating I think a lot of crows, the, so crows eating us. I think that's the most base. I think that's the most, uh, like, I think that's the most simple explanation of the movie that you can, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's like, if you were going to straightforwardly read the story, it would be we attack nature, and nature atta- attacks us. I think leaving it open ended kind of opens it up for whatever interpretation you want, which kind of creates some really fantastic possibilities. Because if that's not the interpretation, like, you know, why is it happening? Which is historically if you're looking into uh you know the bird attack that he's kind of referencing mm-hmm. all right uh karthik so uh i i forget i forgot the name of this author but uh you can you can remind me who wrote tinker tale a soldier spy he died recently the he's a yeah, spy okay. novel author john le Carre, right yeah uh, John Le Carre apparently once met uh, Stanley Kubrick. I, I think I saw somebody share it on Twitter um, to talk about a movie that uh, Stanley Kubrick was pitching him uh, to write a screenplay. And like basically Kubrick was describing some kind of like uh, late stage, like feudalist society where um, people's lives have become so meaningless that they have become indulgent enough that they like, you know, uh, don't even want to have um, any like that. The, they kind of engage in these like orgies um, to feel a little better about themselves, etc. And like uh, Kubrick turns to him uh, and asks, like, where would you set a story like this? And I think John Le Carre um, suggests something like um, 19th century Austria or Vienna or something like that. And then Kubrick turns around and says. We're going to set it in New York City. And this was apparently the pitch for Eyes Wide Shut. So, um, so the New York City, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like kind of a Kubrick, kind of a similar Kubrick's way I felt story, like... Folks. No Epstein, like, okay. no Island. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I kind of felt like this was similarly a kind of late stage capitalism um, allegory more Not than anything else. Um, and like, um, and like the was, fact was, that... 
it was pre late stage capitalism, really. I mean, you know, late stage capitalism kind of is the uh, the more um, PC way of calling neoliberalism, which you know wasn't you know was, was over a, a, a decade later. Maybe I'm it was, yeah. panel for that. In a in a in a way though, in a way though, like they were kind of preempting. I mean, Hitchcock is kind of like preempting it by showcasing the the woman go getter uh, in the role that she is, etc. Uh, but also in a kind of way, like subverting that as well by showing, you know, eventually uh, a different, more complex kind of class analysis that you uh, mentioned. But at the but at the end of the day, I can't help but like think of the the specific nature of the choice of like you know uh, this idyllic um, like suburban seeming or like whatever um, like idyllic town uh, where everything should be boring and uh, mundane, but um Everything so is. much so that like, the only exciting thing yeah. like the only exciting thing that can happen to them is to get under attack like that's the uh most uh eventful that their lives can get and like uh hitchcock is more than happy to provide that and also present it as a sort of morality tale also because like you know uh it is uh, like the birds can be seen as the good uh good side as as we kind of uh, discussed many times uh, and I think, like, I don't know if that, like, could pass the Hayes Code. Like, can you actually present uh, the birds as a moralistic do-gooder tale where the birds are actually correcting for a, a an error or something? I think that's why uh, Animal Attack Horror really started with this film is because you really couldn't um, present, you know, the, the uh, animals attacking us as you did in this. And then, you know, five years later with Planet of the Apes, uh, Jaw, like, well, not Jaws necessarily, but, you know, this animal attack uh, genre where it's not necessarily that we we, we uh, defeat the, the natural force coming after us. You know what I mean? Like the, the natural force coming after us at that point is kind of, um, which is interesting that they base it in reality, like base it in actual things that have happened because the natural force at that time, um, you know, it's you can't really judge it by a, a good versus evil thing. So that's, I think that's why that we hadn't really uh, had this kind of animal attack horror until the birds, which um, really the, the movie that completely, um, you know, uh, stabbed the Hayes code, you know, give it its final little was psycho, uh, psycho and also breathless, but like, you know, that kind of combined uh, a force of two movies that didn't necessarily play with, I mean, breathless was, was happening in France. So obviously it didn't have to, but the mainstream success that it had garnered at that time in 1960, kind of that was the final nail in the coffin as they say of uh of the Hayes code where it kind of was these moralistic tales i think that um it continued on because you see something like bonnie and clyde and like they die at the end of it but still you know you're left with this kind of solidaristic feeling which is exactly what the Hayes code was trying to prevent in, in these cases um so yeah i think that uh i i don't necessarily think that it's it's you don't have to do a, a straightforward naturalistic reading of it and i don't think necessarily it has to be kind of a class analysis it is interesting that there does seem to be a, a new class analysis because there is like the, the the playing of like uh like new rich it feels like like almost like a um citizen kane style uh you know like 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 that kind of like newspaper magnet style rich um the next generation after that versus like a, an old style like you know as as you really kind of get when you hear the first guy's accent like a new england wasp style uh old old rich so it's interesting that, that you're kind of they're kind of playing with this, but at the same time, I think it's interesting that it's played off as these different dynamics, expecting that something's going to come from these dynamics, which it doesn't. The only thing that really comes from this dynamics is that they blame her as an outsider um, for causing these problems briefly, but then you know even then, like you think like something's going to happen to her, it doesn't. Like everyone kind of leaves the town, like you know, like it, it's all these things are kind of built in these in in the sense of these relationships that don't necessarily um i mean they don't amount to anything at all really um i don't know i'm gonna give uh gianni this next the next chance to to give concluding thoughts all right um uh, just again i appreciate uh having me on the panel i i love talking about movies and i need to do it more often loves birds folks uh, loves the birds you, you know what's crazy is i actually do love birds too like in my apartment, I actually have like this little like inlet where like there's like family of pigeons live and they like hatch eggs every like few weeks and I watch the babies grow. Keep them in a gilded cage. Yeah, yeah, I keep them in the cage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, By the way, we didn't really mention the wordplay where uh, he says, uh, you know, you know, as, as with uh, Melanie Daniels, as like a, a Paris Hilton style 
um, socialite, but also prankster kind of being like, oh, her gilded cage is, and you know, she's stuck in this world of, uh, you know, and she's broke the leg. There's no, there's no accountability for it. So I thought, I don't know. I wrote that down to bring up and didn't, but keep some in a cage folks. <laughs> um, but like I said earlier, I, I'm, I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big Hitchcock fan, but the birds is my favorite film of his. And um, we're watching it I like, again. I like Frenzy. I think Frenzy is my favorite Hitchcock film. I, I need to watch um, Wrong Man because that is um, more of a working class Hitchcockian film. And I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, By the way, before the end of the month, you want to come back on for an episode on All the Waterfront? Oh, my God. Yeah, let's actually talk about Let's Off camera, we'll talk about that on the Waterfront. Side. I 100% want to do that. And I don't know why I, the fuck I haven't. I would talk. I would talk more aesthetically and on the waterfront, though, more yeah. than um, meeting. But, so it, but um, you talk aesthetically, and then I'd have some historian, some historian <laughs> that I picked up that needed work. <laughs> <laughs> oh but, yeah. All right. Well, here's here's a perfect uh, Jay Hutch comment for you. <laughs> you should you should get the granddaughter, right? Isn't she a filmmaker and actor and all that? Um, I'm not too sure. Um. But yeah, I, on the waterfront. <laughs> I, I promise you, my uh, my obsession with birds is not related to uh, Dolce Vita. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm taking over uh, to screenshot this and find a perfect. <laughs> please do, please. Gianni, um, Gianni was one time married to a giant bird. <laughs> I, I'm actually fucking no. big bird. You know, if, if, I didn't want to. I didn't, I didn't want to like say. New but... York City, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sesame Street's on the road. Yeah. Uh, so. Put the emphasis on can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? There you go. <laughs> can you tell me how to get can you tell me how to get there? <laughs> uh, but but um <laughs> watching this film um several times and, and really looking deep into it really gave me like a new appreciation um for how not only how Hitchcock did films, but how you can really it, a good film you can dissect several ways mm -hmm. and i think that is that's helped me realize like e even in this short week like if i were to go back and watch some of these films that i have on my wall like how many of them could i really deep down and find so many different meanings to how many could i find connections to how many make timeless connections you know obviously hitchcock was a thing about covid19 when he made the birds but I could still find connections in his film because he made a good film that is timeless. Well, I mean, uh, that's kind of what I connect you so hard about uh, Scorsese um, and, and, you know, uh, similar, you know, directors that we've had more recently. I mean, you know, right now, I don't think we have someone that really does what Scorsese did, but like it's this connection to film itself and this conversation that as someone making, like as a director, you're having a conversation, which is something that I think really came up during this 1960s period. And, I could bring Charlie in on this because I think it's a very, uh, it's an incredibly postmodern, uh, it's a very postmodern reading of, of how to direct film. But there's, there's yes. an incredibly uh, postmodernist um, uh, reading where, where a director um, should be in conversation with everything that's come before him. And yes. I don't necessarily think that, you know, I mean, if you watch anything from the 1940s and 50s, it's not doing that. It's never doing that. Sometimes they're in conversation with, uh, as Kiss Me Deadly, which is the first episode that we did on this show, they're in conversation with the novelization of something, which is something that, you know, directors like Verhoeven have done since then, where you're kind of, um, you're, you're rebelling against the source material you're using for a film, which I honestly love every movie that's doing, that, that's done that, that I've watched, like Kiss Me Deadly is one, but also um, Starship Troopers is another one that, that did that, like, it is literally rebelling against fascist nature, like the, the fascist nature of a book, because in a book you can kind of get away with being a literal fascist um, in the early 20th century, because like that wasn't really looked down upon <laughs> quite as much at that time so you know but like starting with hitchcock but really going into a lot of these um new hollywood directors they're in conversation with the the elements of hollywood itself and and they're kind of conversing with uh, well i mean in, in hitchcock's sense it's amazing because he's conversing with himself he's literally having a dialogue with himself and everything else that he's created uh and saying guess what like guess you guess what like uh early hitchcock fuck you new hitchcock fuck you I'm going to make a movie that literally has subverted my own um, my own collection of films, which is kind of an amazing thing. But it's which, still bad, yeah. which which is which is incredible, even to add to that, which is not part of my final analysis. But even that, like you still see that today, and it still can be done today. I think that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, 
is a great yeah. example of Tarantino doing that to Tarantino. Well, I mean, um, I think that that's also Tarantino in a conversation with New Hollywood, which is a very interesting theme because I think it's an idealized um, thought in his head. That yeah, it's kind of funny that after that, Tarantino wrote a novel, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like, this is what I was... This is what, what I, was I wanted to say. Yeah, no, but, but, like, um, I don't know. Tarantino is a bit heavy-handed. Um, we watched uh, Walker... Uh, not not this Tuesday, the last Tuesday before that, and the movie that kind of went along with Walker was uh, Straight to Hell. Like you know, Alex Cox um, filmed that movie to finance Walker, and um, they're kind of dressed exactly like Pulp Fiction six years before that. Like it's clearly uh, something that obviously Tarantino hasn't you know didn't like you know copy that style, but like clearly was aesthetically inspired by Alex Cox, which makes sense because you know it, it's this. Um, he also, you know, Alex Cox doesn't want to be on on the show, so it makes me sad because I actually had a nice email exchange with him. But um, no, but <laughs> big Alex Cox fans here. Um, no, so so kind of, but you can tell that Tarantino's taking inspiration from uh, this punk rock style of filmmaking that kind of hadn't existed before, low budget, barely scripted, which Tarantino, of course, is kind of created creating a heavily scripted version of that in, in in Pulp Fiction almost like I think Alex Cox is uh like California in that in that film like the concept of that is very similar to uh Tarantino's conception of things of course then Tarantino's conversing with himself but I think that um once upon a time, once upon a time in Hollywood is kind of Tarantino uh uh deflecting himself on kind of almost like a golden cat like the the thought that you know he's been watching movies since he was a kid and he's just so obsessed with this like image of like new Hollywood, like the Roman Polanski, um, which, you know, everybody in that uh, time period has proven to be literally golden caps. Like Roman Polanski is literally like had that little bit of a uh, sympathy and then was proved to have fucked a 13 year old. Like, you know what I mean? Like everyone in that time period is tarnished and Tar Tarantino plays with that once upon a time in Hollywood. Like, you know, you're left kind of, I mean, number one, you know, you're, you're kind of expecting that, that that murder is going to take place. It doesn't. If that murder doesn't take place, Roman Polanski's 13-year-old fucking would probably have come out a lot sooner. There would be no, uh, you know, everybody not knowing that that, that that almost happened even in that sense probably would have brought down Polanski a lot sooner, um, I think. Or or probably wouldn't have happened at all, honestly. If... Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think if you're into that. Um, you're into... But just, again, just to quickly wrap up on the birds, I, I, I really appreciated looking at it again and, and looking at it through different lenses um, and finding different interpretations. And like uh, Hitchcock has an interesting um, connection with feminism or anti-feminism, depending on who you're reading from and trying to dissect depending that. Depending on uh, which Hitchcock shows up to work. Yeah. Well, well, but even but even an analysis of his work, you know, people debate about it all the time, whether his films are feminist or not. And, um, you know, looking, trying to look at it through that lens and finding the connections um, with something very... I, I, would, I would go with the, your interpretation of this movie is. I mean, I, I think uh, this movie is, is an early feminist work. I, 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 think, I think that part of it is me as a 20, 2021 viewer of this film finding the connection. But at the same time, like knowing Hitchcock, knowing what he does, he just loves to stir the pot. And it's definitely, to me, looking at, trying to think about what his vision was is definitely more of the, I'm curious about the human psyche. Like if something random happens, what do we do? What do who do we yeah. blame? Do we- Yeah, do the logic but I, but I also, but I also think that you know? you're kind of, I mean, all right. So I think you're kind of, I think that you're right that we're kind of watching this, this like, I think Carly made this point too, like you're watching this dynamic kind of play out between this, uh, you know, between Melanie Daniels as like, her generation of i mean literally a socialite so i don't think any working class woman would necessarily be given the freedom to fucking jump in a in a um you know in a roman uh <laughs> in a roman fountain but like you're, you're kind of given this uh you're, you're given this uh um yeah so it, it kind of is in concert with itself because um you know the the mother is lydia is lonely and her marriage ended and you know uh, it, it's all these different like things kind of playing out at once that she's kind of kept. She kind of is in a in a cage too. Like she's kept in this house. She is afraid of being abandoned. She doesn't want to leave. Like 
you're, you're watching her obligations, I guess, as, as a, as a stat or as a, as a spouse, um, kind of play out in that sense. Her husband's died and there's no purpose left. Her only purpose is raising her kids, which makes it interesting that she has an 11 year old kid because she's still kind of raising a kid. What would have happened if she didn't have an 11 year old kid and her kids were both adults? Like, you know, and she can't connect with her kids either. She can't on that level. Like she says that her husband connected with the kids and she doesn't like, right. Right. Um, so, uh, Charlie, you got concluding thoughts? Um, <clears throat> I need a cigar, so I look like a villain. <laughs> um, with my well, cat. With two cats, I don't think you look like a villain. With two cats, you look overwhelmed. With one cat... There's a, thir- there's a third cat back there that you can't see. The cats that- look like a villain in that. In that. Well, uh, but my, my concluding thoughts is, since we're all throwing out directors who are not Hitchcock that we like... Uh, mine right, is play the game directors that are not Hitchcock and go. <laughs> uh, Werner Herzog is my favorite director. Um, and he has this interesting concept of an ecstatic truth. And the only reason I was going to bring that up is you were talking about the dialogue in postmodern films. You're into you're into little people in armor, aren't you? That's what you're you know just running around, <laughs> running around film sets that are made to look like medieval Germany. <laughs> Well, no comment. No, I'm kidding. No, but, <laughs> no, but um, uh, what I was thinking of, though, is you're talking about how postmodern films are kind of a conversation with the audience through various different mediums, various different ideas, objects, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, the interesting thing is I think that we have started to see an evolution away from that. Um, now, and I say start to, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, start to, uh, because the main person I see it in is Werner Herzog and his notion of ecstatic truth, um, where he where he will deliberately in films, uh, he will manipulate things to make a point. Um, for example, he has a documentary, uh, Little Dieter Needs to Fly, and if you notice... He took down some picture in the guy's house and he put a, or not, no, he um, uh, told the actor, or not the actor, the person to open and shut doors a bunch. And he said that that was the guy's, you know, some hang up he has. And it turns out that's not true. That guy doesn't actually open and shut doors like that. (laughs) But it was, it was to make a point because if you go in the guy's house, uh, he has a whole bunch of pictures of doors that are open. And it reveals a fear because he was a POW in Vietnam and he was locked in cages a lot that he has a kind of a, a very subtle obsession with leaving doors open, but it may be just not exact. But anyway, so it's a, I, I just wanted to add that to your, your, your talk. Well, about so time. I would say another, uh, heard our point, um, is, uh, so I think that when you look at the birds and I think the way you look at jaws, they're all kind of based on real stories, but like, incredibly embellished like almost fisherman tales of right. stories when he makes grizzly man he literally makes a documentary about like kind of he's doing he's doing what these animal attack movies are afraid to do afraid to tell the actual straightforward story of of one of these attacks so right. it's interesting that like the timothy treadwell version of that um in grizzly man is like you know he's making a documentary because you, you don't all like whether you look at jaws which is a real story of you know shark attacks in cape cod or you look at the birds, the real story of bird attacks in Santa Cruz, you know, these fantastical um, allegorical versions of it. When you look at Grizzly Man, you can't really make an allegorical. It's literally right. just like a guy goes into nature and says, guess what, nature? I got dominion over you. And then right. nature says, no, you have uh, dinner. You right, are- right. And, like- and <laughs> it, 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 it's also used because, like, for example, the scene where uh, the his – I think it's his – it's is it, it's somebody who's related to uh, the grizzly man. Uh, I forget who it is. I, I honestly forget. But she was given his watch or his his effects or whatever, uh, which was a scene that was set up. It was it was not you know kind of a natural aspect of everything going on. But uh, what I found interesting with that is he's also that- him looking. He's clearly watch- or listening to the uh, the attack yes. happen, and he's like, "Oh, you can't." Which he doesn't yeah. have the power to do that. He doesn't have the power to be like, oh, you can't listen to your family member get bent. Right, right. You know, you're, right. you can't be like, oh, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Like, it's right. Not. 
He, uh, but <laughs> it's it's interesting that his the 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 contrast between him, say, and like postmodern filmmakers like Hitchcock is that, like you were saying, Hitchcock bases his movie off real things, but maybe embellishes it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Herzog is trying to reveal something more real, at least in his words. And so he uses lying as a tool to reveal as something. Germans do. Yes. It, 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 he, he, uh, yes. It's his final solution. Well, Wait, I, no, fuck. <laughs> well, I, well, I was going to say my, uh, yeah, my uh, great, great, great grandparents had to escape the Nazis. So, yeah, they do lie. Well, um, I guess started with you, John. Uh, you want to plug anything before we go? Absolutely. Um, so you could find me on uh, Twitch, uh, TJRS. That's TJRS, the John Ross Show. I'm going to kind of be switching it up because I'm going back to school, so I'm going to switch over to doing nights. Haven't really got a time uh, set yet, but I hope to do that in probably about a week. Uh, you can read me on Substack, uh, tjrs.substack.com. Everyone's got a substack, right? Yeah. I, I don't do it like words. Glenn Greenwald does it, unfortunately. So Every, just trying to distinguish me. myself. I got to distinguish myself from Glenn Greenwald. And uh, Karthik, next. <laughs> you wanna you wanna plug anything? Yeah, definitely uh, check out Left Flank Vets. Uh, we're trying to line up some uh, good interviews with uh, musicians who are doing what we consider to be revolutionary work, which is uh, you know not just uh, like doing lip service to issues, but actually like working with the community, actually making the music um, that the industry doesn't want to hear, et cetera. And like we recently had Napoleon, uh, the legend and Nejma Nefertiti who had- uh, Great. Napoleon the legend is like amazing. Yeah. And like, and and it's so good to, you know, uh, through that experience and through talking to Napoleon and like to get a sense of uh, what kind of artists there are who are actually doing this kind of work because you know there is no central repository uh, where you can just like find people who are doing revolutionary work the same way there is like a billboard chart there isn't like a revolutionary tracks chart right so it'd be pretty cool to have like a space where you have uh, a whole other alternative uh, group of musicians who uh, are not like part of some kind of um, aesthetic counterculture but like are engaged in some kind of um, uh, restructuring of the of the thing itself of music uh, consumption in in this you know uh, society and like uh, we have a couple of other uh, interviews lined up. We're definitely gonna have this uh, artist called the Narcissist. He also calls himself Iraq Began the uh, began the whole like hashtag musicians for Palestine, um, and um, it was pretty like one of the uh, more vocal um, you know supporters of Palestine from the beginning um, and like has had collaborations with many uh, international artists like he himself is um, Canadian and I I believe Iraqi Canadian Uh, I'm not 100% sure but uh, we'll get to talk to him we've been listening to his music for over a couple of weeks and then we also have like something coming up with uh, hopefully soon uh, Bamboo uh, who has like you know been uh, wanting to appear on left flank for a while so uh, through this process like maybe more and more uh, r- radical artists we'll interview so um, hopefully uh, the viewers of movie night can also tune into left flank once in a while it kind of feels like you uh left flank and uh you know this is a revolution are building up kind of twin platforms which is really cool because you know, of all the stuff that they've all done at the same time, like Marcus is on this revolution, you know, regularly, like it kind of feels like building up that apparatus is something that's really happening, like on an, on an extremely ground level on both of those platforms. And like, that's honestly amazing to me. Um, Gianni, anything you want to plug? Um, yeah. So please check out Alone on Netflix. I believe it might be also on Discovery+. Plus. Not Discovery Plus. What is that new one? That uh, what is that? Well, one of the streaming services that are pretty big that came out of maybe Paramount Plus. Um, I am a filmmaker and producer, and all of my work I always share on Instagram. So please uh, and Twitter. So please follow me. My handle is um, uh, not right next to my name there. And um, yeah, of course, thank you so much for having me on, dude. I love talking movies. Yeah, so I'll bring you on. You know, 
uh, a lot, a lot more than whatever. I, I think it's, you know, I, I feel like I've had people that I've purely met off this whole like podcasting, uh, things that I've been doing. And like, I don't know, I have like so many people that are like incredible, like IRL friends of mine <laughs> that <laughs> I want to have on. I mean, including, uh, Izzy, but you know, he had a, you know, he has a kid and like, I think he kind of had to, you know, he's been kind of exhausted. So kind of hopped off early, but like, uh, you know, it, it's been fun. It, it's, it's fun to have like people, you know, I always get more nervous though for having like, like, you know, real life friends on that I do for, you know, uh, <laughs> the podcast. All right. No, um, it was a pleasure. Thank you, man. Yeah. Uh, Charlie. <laughs> if, if you want eloquent, um, if you want cynical, snarky, but eloquent, uh, phrased essays to read. Um, you can go to my uh, Substack. It's called Ferrochia Anime. I am sure it's the only one that, the only Substack that's got a Latin title. Um, I wouldn't be so sure about that. You want to be so sure? Well, you never heard of Biggest Dickest dot Substack. <laughs> 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 oh, <God>. uh, <laughs> um. But it's uh, my sub my Substack is called Ferrochia Anime. I also sometimes write for the International Magazine as well as the Human Front. So if you want to go follow those pages, um, the I, Human I, Front I, obviously being the bird run. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, it's it's where we make the drones. Um, and uh, I don't know I, that that that's about that's about it for me. All right. Well, um, my my big plug, I guess. I mean, obviously, watch this is Revolution because that's an amazing podcast, and I always want to promote that. But um, our our big plug, I guess, is that on Tuesday we're gonna be watching uh, Sid and Nancy, and it's gonna be pretty fucking amazing. Cause we have Jamie Peck coming on, and uh, along with Conan Neutron, C. Derek Barr, and like you know, I mean, the 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 stacked uh, panel we usually have, but and I'll having be uh, Jamie so. Peck on that is gonna be no relation to the birds. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna be a pretty is gonna be a pretty fucking amazing show so i i definitely want to say that um with that i guess i will just say left is best <laughs>